Kicking off the list at number 10, it's Tim Drake. This first Joker defeat comes in Detective Comics number 826. Kicking off the action in this story, Tim Drake, Robin, is on the run from some criminals and barely keeping it together when a random car pulls up and offers him an escape. Taking the free help, Robin jumps on the opportunity only to find out the driver of the said car is the Joker himself, wearing a Santa hat. Joker hits him with some knockout gas and when Tim comes back too, he's tied up and gagged in the passenger seat of the car with his utility belt tossed out the window. While going on this horrific joyride with the Joker where he took the lives of multiple people, Tim proved just how great of a Robin he'd become by completely taking the Joker off guard by quoting the Marx Brothers. Joker loves this, but then Tim starts purposely getting the facts of his quotes wrong, distracting the Joker who tries to correct the young Robin while Tim gets his hand free and then sucks Joker with a real good punch right across the jaw. He then grabs the rear view mirror and smacks the clown over the head with it and then jumps in the back seat where he gets the upper hand on the Joker, taking his own gas and spraying it in the Joker's face. Joker goes flying out the car door and has to throw himself off of a bridge to avoid getting hit by a truck. He got a Robin once, but he ain't gonna get this one. Number nine. Tax evasion. In Detective Comics number 180, the clown prince of crime ends up inheriting $250 million from the recently deceased King Barlow. With all this money, the Joker decides to retire from crime and goes on a shopping spree. Understandably so. In an almost too real turn of events though, the Joker has to pay the IRS an inheritance tax of more than he actually has remaining or he faces going to jail for tax evasion. Of all the things that the Joker has done, it's tax evasion that is truly what threatens him the most. And knowing the way the government comes after people who evade their taxes, that actually kind of makes sense. But what makes the whole thing so much worse for the Joker is that he learns that the money he inherited is all fake, and the whole thing was actually a prank from King Barlow. The Joker can either admit the money is counterfeit, which would cause him to become the laughing stock of the criminal underworld, or evade the government for life for the ruthless crime of tax evasion. Instead, the Joker chooses option number three and decides to try to steal some money only for Batman to stop him and put him in Arkham Asylum yet again. Coming in at number eight, it's my smile. The ongoing story behind Birds of Prey issue number 124 doesn't really matter too much, but basically the Joker has figured out where Barbara Gordon, aka Oracle, is based at, and he shows up with all the bravado you'd expect, trying to take her off the board, relying on their previous interactions to keep her afraid and mistake prone. He goes stalking through the halls of the clock tower, but Babs, she ain't afraid. She reveals herself and the Joker goes for his attack, throwing a knife which she intercepts, catching it on one of her billy clubs. What she can't block are the bullets he then sends flying her way. But dodging bullets seems to be one of her many skills. Trying to get a better shot, he comes even closer, bringing him within her striking range, allowing her to disable his trusty blam blam. He gets one good smack on her before Oracle uses her other club to hit him in the mouth so hard her club actually cracks. But that wasn't the only thing that cracked. Babs had hit the Joker so hard that she broke almost all of his teeth and knocked out a good chunk of them as well, destroying one of the things that the Joker prizes most his smile. This next one is honestly one of the most surprising brutal beatdowns I have ever read. This one also comes from Saga. I love Saga, in case you didn't know. I'm not up to date on it by any means, but everything that I've read so far in this series, I've been obsessed with, and I really do want to get up to date. I just need to, need to read a lot of things. <laughs> There's a lot of issues. It's just such a great series overall though, so it really is worth the time. If you haven't checked it out, I do highly recommend just getting even that first volume and giving it a read. It'll hook you. Just the first few issues should be enough to just blow your mind. This brutal beatdown is also from near the beginning of the story as well. The Will is a bounty hunter. He has also been given the contract to hunt down Alana and Marco, but kind of early on he decides he might give up on the contract. Feeling he's already been beaten, he decides to use his unlimited credit card that he has, that he was given for the job to um, basically entertain himself. But while pursuing this entertainment, he runs into a really, really bad guy. Now most characters in Saga are very grayscale when it comes to their alignment, both capable of good and bad deeds. The Will, honestly, included. He's kind of terrible, but also he's got some pros. But I think we can all agree that this guy, the one he's up against, is like the actual worst. He's very bad. Needless to say, the Will surprised me by making very quick work of him discombobulate, bringing it to a new level. I don't even know if you can show it, that's how brutal it is. But basically, it's giving him one of 
These, the head squeeze. Moving on, the Whispering War is something we saw happen in both the comics of Walking Dead and the show. The show depicted the war a bit differently from the comics. There it was more like a literal war with armies on each side and one side hunting down and eradicating the other in the end to win. Moving right along, Horizon is basically one of the worst of the worst of the worst when it comes to Spawn comics. He's a powerful villain and immortal god who was basically imprisoned on earth by the combined forces of heaven and hell. Yeah, that's how bad he is. Heaven and hell were willing to work together to take him down. However, Urizen was eventually freed from his prison and escaped. This was a world ending scenario, not just because of Urizen's own power, but because his being unleashed was part of a plan crafted by Malbolgia to spark Armageddon on earth. When Spawn first fought Urizen, it didn't go well, to say the least, which is why when he returned empowered by the ruler of Green World, Gaia herself, Earth, the beatdown felt pretty cathartic. If Spawn vs. Horizon was cathartic, this next point was heart wrenching. One of the most heartfelt fights you probably weren't expecting is the one that happens between Throg or Thrag, I'm still not sure how we're gonna say that, I'm waiting to hear it, in the animated series, and Omni Man. These two fought during issue 138 of Invincible in a rematch. After Throg had been banished, he created his own hybrid child army by teaming up with the Thraxans. He had a lot of kids while he was away, and when he returned, he sicked his offspring on Earth and took his own fight directly to Nolan. You might wonder how or why we'd ever feel bad for what happens to Omni Man here if you're a fan of the animated series, but trust me when I say that Omni Man is way more complex than you might otherwise think. Well, season one, and I would say kind of still the first half of season two, even paints him as like a pretty antagonistic and kind of like shady dude. There is definitely more to him than that. And at the end of the day, he's still Mark's dad. While the two have had their issues, Mark honestly does love him. Even when he's being a jerk, he loves him. Even when he's in denial, he does love him. And at this point in the comics, he was more redeemed than we've seen him before, which is why it was heartbreaking when we watched Nolan be brutally defeated by Throg, who not only put his fist through Nolan's chest, aiming for his heart, but then when he missed, he just tore Nolan open. Terrible. Switching over to a different comic series with this next point, Spawn and Zera are opposites. While Spawn is one of the most powerful beings in hell, especially after Malbolgia is defeated, Zera is God's most prized warrior. She was an angel whom God granted immortality to so she could never die. At a time in Spawn when the war between heaven and hell was very dangerously present on earth, these two meet up and Spawn, basically being God tier at that time, makes quick work of Zera, slicing her in half. What's even more brutal is that Zera would survive this fight, but only as like a disembodied head due to her immortality. Cause yeah, she can't die, which in that way kind of becomes a curse when you're just a head. Spawn might be brutal, but there is another series that I think of first when it comes to beatdowns. I talked about it at the beginning of the list, you know where I'm going. I wish I could limit how much I talk about Invincible, but truly it's challenging. I just love it so much. The series is just so good, and it honestly is some of the most brutal beatdowns in comic book history. So yeah, we're going back there again. I'm gonna talk about it again. This fight is now one that many know about thanks to the Invincible animated series. As Omni-Man's true motivations are revealed to Mark, the two come to blows, and while Invincible is reluctant to fight against his father, Omni-Man is less inclined to hold back honestly. This fight was so brutal, it quickly became one of the most iconic and most memeable ones ever. Seriously, it's between Invincible and Omni-Man for me, and Anakin and Obi-Wan in terms of like equally memeable and memorable brutal fights. Both of those are very memeable, I think. Next up, this has to be one of the most brutal fights within Image and within honestly all of comics. It spanned five issues and multiple days with the series popping back to just remind you each issue, yeah, that's still going on. Those two are still fighting. I can't even give you one issue to read because that simply just doesn't exist. As it unfolds, it gets more and more brutal and gruesome. This is mainly because this fight goes down between Throg and Battle Beast. These two fight because Battle Beast has decided to team up with the Coalition of Planets and is sent to defeat Throg. But what he's truly after is not necessarily to um, complete his mission, but to die a warrior's death here. He sees Throg as his equal or possibly his superior when it comes to battle and hopes to die at his hands or defeat one of the few who has actually managed to stand against him. To give you an example of just how intense this fight is, 
In the beginning, Throg is badly wounded when Ragnars are also unleashed from Battle Beast's ship at the start of their fight. Battle Beast was told that the Ragnars wouldn't be unleashed except as a last resort. And if you don't know this, Ragnars are basically some of the ultimate enemies against Viltrumites because they can actually break their skin. One of the few beings in the cosmos who can break a Viltrumite skin, to be clear. After defeating the Ragnars, Battle Beast notices Throg's wound and injures himself to match to once again ensure this fight is fair. So not only does Battle Beast turn on the Ragnars, but then he also is like, oh you're wounded? Me too. Now we fight again. And then they fight for days. Coming in at number 10 is Ultimate Captain America versus Kleiser. The Ultimate Universe has a ton of absolutely insane moments to choose from, all of which would work for this list. But for this point, I want to talk about a time when Captain America went a little bit overboard. In Ultimates number 12, Captain America is caught in a fight with Herr Kleiser, an old German rival. Just for better context, Herr Kleiser is actually one of the Chitauri, and they launched a full scale invasion of Earth in the modern day, which gave Captain America the opportunity to put Kleiser down for good. So, Herr Kleiser is naked following a fiery explosion and the two are just going punch for punch with Kleiser even getting the upper hand and ranting about eating Steve's face, which is weird. After Nick Fury tries to intervene and Kleiser tries to make Cap surrender, Captain America finally gets the upper hand. Now Captain America pins Kleiser down and lifts his shield above his head and slams it down edge first right into Kleiser's chest, basically slicing him in half. Then, Captain America insults the entire country of France, and it's really weird. Number 9, Captain Marvel vs Thor. During quite possibly Carol Danvers darkest storyline, The Last Avenger, taking place in Captain Marvel Volume 10 number 12, a living suit controlled by a cosmic villain is forcing Carol to wipe out the Avengers. Issue number 12 opens with Captain Marvel catching Thor, the god of thunder, off of guard, launching a surprise attack to take him down. But Thor is a god and it's going to take quite a lot more to bring him down. The two start a battle that sees them tear across the entire planet, from Greenland to Kansas to the middle of the Pacific Ocean and then to space. Thor barely has any idea what's going on and Carol was just going ham. Carol managed to use an energy beam to send Mjolnir extremely far away into space and then another massive blast, she managed to incapacitate the God of Thunder and current ruler of Asgard. The final pages of this issue then show Carol displaying Thor's detached head. So yeah, a pretty brutal battle indeed. Blech. Number 8, Iron Man vs the Mandarin. Nothing seems to ever get as intense, as destructive, as a battle between a hero and their nemesis. And in Invincible Iron Man number 28, Tony Stark and what is arguably his most well known villain, the Mandarin, go head to head. At this time, Mandarin was carrying out a plan to release the extremist virus into the population that would wipe out anyone without a very specific genetic makeup, which was only a very small number of the population, and it would grant those who remained superpowers. Iron Man came into this fight hot and did not cool off until it was over. This fight was a knockdown drag out fight that saw Iron Man rip the ten rings from Mandarin's spine, engage in a battle of fisticuffs with this powerful old man, and then finally Stark repulsorated the ever living lights out of the Mandarin, who then proceeded to sick the extremist virus on Stark who used a refrigerant to not only halt the virus, but also freeze Mandarin solid. Iron Man then promptly passed out. In at number 7, Injustice. You knew this was going to be on the list. The Superman of the Injustice Universe has pretty much the same history as the baseline Superman, but when the Joker kidnaps the pregnant Lois Lane, it lures Superman into a trap of fear gas. In his poison state, Superman hallucinates his true love as the villain Doomsday and instantly attacks, flying Lois and his unborn child into space, killing them both and inadvertently causing a nuclear bomb to destroy his city, Metropolis. After suddenly losing his city and loved ones in one go, Superman goes into an honest understandable rage, bursting into the interrogation room where Batman is learning the true intentions of the Joker and plunges his super fist through the guy's chest. Following these events, Superman takes control of the earth and rules it as a tyrant. Fortunately, Batman forms an insurgency to try and beat this corrupted Superman, eventually listing the aid of another Earth's Justice League and I guess it's a big hullabaloo, but Joker got a hole through his chest and that's the point. 
Number 6, Mad Love. The Batman story Mad Love tells the story of how the Joker manipulated Harley and Quinzel into becoming his almost equally insane boo, Harley Quinn. Eventually, over the course of the story, Harley decides that she's going to try and do her bubby boo proud by capturing the Dark Knight and putting an end to his long crime fighting life. The funny thing is that Harley basically gets all the way there. Harley is meticulous over every detail and rechecks everything until Batman wakes up hanging upside down dangling over a piranha infested fish tank. This is when Batman pulls a trick out of his sleeve. First of all, he reveals the Joker's manipulation tactics to Harley and that almost breaks the girl's heart. But then, he essentially tells Harley that unless Joker sees the deed himself, he would never believe that Harley could have done it. This gives Harley some grief and so she calls up the Joker himself and informs him of the situation. Situation. This drives Joker mental, as he can't stand the thought of his girlfriend stealing his spotlight. So much so that he basically causes her to go crashing out a window and he frees the Batman himself. In a moment of clarity, Joker realizes he could take this opportunity to take down the Batman, and I suppose he forgot that he just leveled the playing field for the Dark Knight, who quickly gets the upper hand and it leads to the Joker's defeat. This was after the Batman admits to Joker that Harley got closer to beating him than the Joker ever has, and then adds a little extra slap in the face when he calls Joker Puddin. Number 5. Red Hood If you haven't read Three Jokers, please go do that. It's kind of treated as its own separate story apart from the DC Universe, and whether that's true or not, it's up to personal preference, but it's a really good story. But that's not important. Essentially, it's revealed that instead of there being one person over the course of history who has been the Joker, there have actually been Three, the clown, the comedian, and the criminal. Each have been seen at different times and have been involved in some of the biggest moments in Batman history. The clown is the one first caught in the story and he also happens to be the one who laid a crowbar shaped beat down on a young Jason Todd, Robin. With the help of Jason Todd and Batgirl, Batman tracks down the clown and together they subdue him. Unfortunately, Batman has to run off to help out with the second Joker, leaving the clown in the hands of Babs and Jason Todd. That may have been a mistake. The Joker wastes no time time getting to his tactic of driving people up the wall, using his attack on Todd to drive Red Hood to the point of no return, and Red Hood introduces Joker to the afterlife with a well placed ball of lead through the Joker's cranium. Number 4, Joker War. Joker War has probably one of the coolest Joker vs Batman fights Ever. By taking over Wayne Enterprises and exposing Batman's connections with the GCPD, Joker leaves Bruce without access to his vast wealth. This is part of what leads to Bruce assuming his Batman identity full time as the Joker's masked goons do everything to break into his various bat caves in order to gain control of his tech and sensitive information. And the Joker is more than successful, getting a prototype futuristic bat suit and jokerizing it. He also takes the corpse of the recently passed away Alfred Pennyworth and reanimates it with Joker Toxin. His Pretty messed up, and the climactic fight between Joker and Batman in Ace Chemicals is equally as intense. After going through an absolute slog fest against each other, Joker actually gains the upper hand, and just as he is about to do a number on Batman's face, Harley Quinn shows up out of nowhere, placing a shot right in the clown's right eye, which didn't kill him, which is weird. She then ties up Joker alongside a little bang bang boom boom device, and then straps one to herself and runs off, telling Batman that he has to pick which one of them he is going to save. Joker is pretty confident that Batman will have to save him, but then Batman, pretty confidently himself, waltzes past him and runs off to save Harley, leaving the Joker to be blown to smithereens. Number 3. Paralyzed In the lead up to Joker War that we just talked about, Joker actually pays a visit to one member of the Bat family in particular. In Batgirl number 47, Barbara gets home and is chillaxing on the couch when she begins to realize that her things are ever so slightly out of place, alerting her to someone else's presence in the room. Like a ninja, she hurls a glass into the dark, smashing it into the Joker's grinning mug. After getting in more than a few good solid hits on the Joker, the criminal turns the tables by whipping out a small remote, pressing a button, and deactivating the implant in Barbara's spine that restored her ability to walk. The Joker reveals that his remote can apparently manipulate Barbara's body to move against her will. But even that doesn't phase Barbara too much. Instead, she starts to psychologically torment the Joker, using the fact that he is obsessed with the Dark Knight to manipulate him where she wants him. In a rather twisted turn of events, she ends up having the last laugh when she uses a sharp pipe to stab herself in the back, fully disabling the implant and Joker's hold on her. And then she hurdles that same pipe into the Joker's spine, seemingly paralyzing him. 
Number two, Nightwing. In Joker Last Laugh, Joker is locked up in the slab and was told he had a terminal brain tumor and only a limited amount of time left to live. But this was all just an attempt by those working at the penitentiary to cause the Joker to face the end of his own life and possibly come to terms with his own wrongdoings. They clearly don't understand the Joker though. Instead, the Joker decided to bring his crime to a whole other level so that he would go out in a blaze of glory. He essentially only a special Joker toxin on a huge number of supervillains, turning them a bit more Joker-like. One of these villains was Killer Croc. The Bat family sprung into action, but the Robin at the time, Tim Drake, was captured by Croc, leaving only his torn costume. With the other Bat family members assuming the worst had happened to the younger crime fighter, the original Robin, Dick Grayson, Nightwing, went on the warpath. He tracked down the Joker and proceeded to lay an absolutely bloody beat down on him, even when Tim revealed himself and tried to stop Dick. Nightwing thought it was some kind of trick and carried on his punch fest until the Joker actually passed away. Batman himself had to step in and revive the Joker with CPR, I don't know how that works, but for a moment there, Nightwing actually beat the Joker into the afterlife. And finally, in at our number one spot, he stabs himself. For our number one spot, it only makes sense to talk about Joker's very first appearance and also his very first embarrassing defeat. In Batman numero uno, we are introduced to the Joker for the first time. The Joker has been the perpetrator of some pretty vicious crimes across Gotham and the Batman ends up on the case. When the two first get into an altercation, the Joker actually gets the upper hand on Bruce, whacking him with a good haymaker and then a kick before pushing him off a bridge. It's not until a bit later after the Joker has caused a whole whack more unfortunate deaths and even face the Batman a few more times, even getting kicked in the face by the board wonder himself, that the Joker makes a triumphant return. Sort of. After a whole altercation at a museum, the Joker is pursued by both Batman and his boy Wonder. In the final climactic battle, Bruce and Robin have Joker on the ropes until Joker pulls out a dagger, trying to bring the Batman down for good. Turns out, Batman is pretty quick, who'd have thought? And he sidesteps, causing the Joker to accidentally plunge the dagger into his own chest. But as we are all pretty well aware of, this wasn't his true end. In fact, it was just his beginning. Number 10, Punisher versus a Criminal. This is going to be an interesting one to try and describe. This devastating beatdown comes from Punisher Max issue number 28. If you don't know Punisher Max and you like brutal moments and storytelling, this might be a series for you to check out. In issue number 28 of the series, before he gets to the head of a criminal operation that he's in the process of stopping, Frank deals with the son of the operation's head, Chris Tu, attempting to get information from him on his father, Tiberiu, and their associate, Vera. He attempts to get him to talk by seemingly numbing him and then using his organs as basically uh, decor for a tree. We don't know of Chris Dew's fate, but I can't imagine it ended well for him, knowing how Frank usually deals with criminals. Although he did promise that if Chris Dew gave him the information he was looking for, he'd actually be okay, and Frank would use his medic training and knowledge to save his life. Though I personally wouldn't trust that knowledge myself if it was Frank Castle and he did that to me. Next on the list is the Hulk versus the Sentry. Okay, this is one of the craziest throwdowns in Marvel history. History. This one takes place in World War Hulk number five. So picture this, the Hulk, fueled by rage, obviously, returns to Earth ready to serve some serious payback to those who banished him from the planet. On the flip side, we've got the Sentry, this hero who's holding back because he's terrified of the enormous power he wields. Basically like the Marvel equivalent of Superman here. When these two finally face off, it was like fireworks on the 4th of July. Explosions, chaos, destruction everywhere. The Sentry unleashed his powers, sending the Hulk flying through buildings things like they were made of cardboard. But you know the Hulk, he's tough as nails, so he took these hits and dished them right back like a titanic game of ping pong. Now what's mind boggling here is the sheer power they both brought to the table. They clashed so hard that their energies actually canceled each other out, reverting them both back to their normal human forms. But in the final moments, it was the Hulk who landed the knockout blow on the sentry. Now even after this fight, the Hulk still seething with anger almost tore New York apart just by taking a step. That's how crazy powerful he was, even after after tangling with centuries, so it's kind of safe to say that the Hulk technically won the battle, but man, the strength here on display was off the charts. 
If you're enjoying this video so far, please support the channel by pressing like, subscribing to Top 10 Nerd, and ringing that notification bell. Number 8, Uranus versus Magneto. During an X-Men Red tie-in issue for the AXC Judgment Day event, in a fight that lasted barely a page and a half, Uranus completely, and I mean completely, destroys Magneto. And I really do mean, literally, destroys him. And never mind Magneto, although that brief battle is something to behold, Uranus completely wrecks most of planet Araco too. Well him and his army, but I mean still, wrecking a whole planet, that's insane. Well Magneto would later on get some sweet revenge on Uranus, in the first fight the two have here, Uranus manages to wrench Magneto's heart from his body, seemingly killing him. However we later learn of course that Magneto manages to stay alive to fight another day, but get this, literally controlling the metal in his blood. What? Controlling its flow throughout his body, even without a heart. Basically using the iron in his blood to pump the blood throughout his body. That's what? That's crazy. Number 7. Captain America versus Captain America. We all battle our own inner demons once in a while, but for Captain America, he had to literally face his own evil self. In the Secret Empire storyline, a Hydra loving version of Steve Rogers, lovingly referred to as Stevel, had managed to take control of the entire United States, committing seriously heinous acts to ensure his success. Luckily, with the help of Kobik and Captain America's family of heroes, the regular Steve Rogers that we know and love managed to make it back to our reality, and he and Stevel finally went head to head in Secret Empire number 10. While Stevel had a completely different ideology than Captain America, he still retained all of his skill and tactical know-how, and was armed with a very Iron Man-like armor, which made this fight one of the most intense hand-to-hand -hand fights I have ever seen in a comic in a hot minute. While the two are evenly matched in terms of skill, Stevel is evil, and Cap is decidedly not evil, which means that Captain America is very much worthy of wielding the hammer of Thor, and Stevel was only capable of wielding disappointment. Number six. Thanos versus the Champion. The comic story known as Thanos Quest essentially recounts exactly how Thanos went about acquiring the Infinity Stones from across the universe. Now, Thanos faced various challenges and challengers to acquire each stone. The Power Stone specifically was held by a guy known as the Champion, an elder of the universe just like the Collector and the Grand Master. Thanos came upon Champion on a planet that is constantly fought over by five different factions, and he's just here fighting scores of soldiers for his own amusement. Thanos just swoops in and challenges Champion to a fight, which the Elder accepts without a second thought. Now, while Champion, powered by the Infinity Stone, is much more powerful than Thanos, he is effectively an idiot. Like, he didn't even know that the stone was the thing giving him his unlimited power. Thanos outthought Champion multiple times, even allowing Champ to destroy the entire planet that they were fighting on. Thanos didn't beat up Champion, but he outsmarted and embarrassed the guy to the point Champion traded the power gem for a toe to a another planet. What an idiot. Number 5. Spider-Man vs. Morlin. It's all fun and games until somebody gets poked in the eye. Or maybe if you're Spider-Man, it's all fun and games until you get your eye yanked out. Perhaps one of the worst things I could imagine, uh, in the Spider-Man storyline, the other, evolve or die, we see Spider-Man go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Morlin, and he gets his butt kicked. It gets so bad that Spider-Man actually breaks his knuckles while he's trying to fight this dude. That's how intense this battle already is. Things, of course, take a horrible turn for the worse when Morlin decides to grab Spider-Man's left eye and then yank. No, he didn't, Spider-Man says. Oh, yes, he did. I said out loud on the bus in front of people. Dude, he pulled his eyeball out, and then to make us feel even more sick than we already do, Morlin proceeds to eat his eyeball and even commented on how delicious it was. But if I could ask one question, do the eye colors matter when it comes to like eyeball flavor? Like I got brown eyes, maybe that's like a, a maple-y kind of smoky kind of vibe. I don't know, maybe my eyes are pretty yummy. Somebody ask Army Hammer, see what he thinks about eyes. Number four, Hulk versus everybody. Okay, this one's pretty wild. So Thor Ragnarok was loosely based off of the Planet Hulk storyline. And I say loosely because in the comics, well, that story didn't end up going so well. See, on Sakaar, the rocket that he arrived in ended up blowing to smithereens, causing some casualties that left him a little heartbroken, to say the least. So he rolls his shoulders back a few times, and then he heads back to Earth, and thus begins the World War Hulk storyline. He just destroys everybody. I mean, all the heroes that Earth loves at this point just in the path of this death train. Like he locks the Illuminati in Madison Square Garden, and then he makes them fight to the death. That in itself is brutal. That's crazy. But I mean, I guess if you spend enough time on Sakaar, that just becomes second nature, you know? 
The whole story is a bloody good mess. I mean, it's great seeing the panic on the Avengers' faces this entire time. It's scary. So make sure if you haven't already to grab all five issues of 2007's World War Hulk, because it's a treat. The whole thing's a big battle. Number three, Spider-Man close to home. So when a supervillain escapes, it's not a great time. Usually they're gonna come back for the person that put them in there in the first place. So Ultimate Spider-Man's death is absolutely beautiful and of course it's really, really sad. It's done really well. So after tackling Captain America and literally taking a bullet for him, Peter is left to fight the Green Goblin, Electro, Sandman, Vulture, and Kraven. They are all waiting for him. They all wanted a piece of the spider and in the end they got what they wanted. The entire climax happens in Peter's neighborhood, basically. So everybody's running to safety and he's limping around. He's doing his absolute best. He's pulling off fire hydrants and using Electro's current to do some damage to other guys. He's giving it everything he's got. And that's the beauty of this one. He's exhausted from the start. He gets shot before this fight even happens. And you feel it while you're reading it. This is a plot that I think we're gonna finally see in the next Spider-Man movie. I mean, hopefully, with all these villains knowing Peter's true identity now, we could get them all literally showing up at his house, bringing the battle to him. Let's just hope it doesn't end the same way with Peter's heroic death. See, Miles actually saw this whole fight take place, so it actually inspired him to take on the mantle of Spider-Man. So these villains may have won this time, but Miles Morales is coming for you. Number two, Deadpool kills the Marvel Universe. This issue was released in August 2012, and it is exactly what it sounds like. So what's the story here? Why does Wade want everybody dead? Well, the X-Men put Wade into the Ravencroft Asylum in attempts to heal his insanity, but the doctor wasn't too good at handling a task because the doctor was actually Dr. Psycho Man. So the procedure went well, I'd say. You know, something happened. He brainwashed Wade in hopes to shut down all these inner voices, and well, it worked. Awesome. Hooray, there we go. It worked, but the only downside was those voices were now replaced with voices that were encouraging him to kill everybody in the Marvel Universe. And this is a must read. From start to finish, it is brutal, it is graphic, it's an easy one on this list. Number one, Iron Man vs. Captain America. Seeing two of your friends argue is uncomfortable enough, let alone seeing two of your superhero friends try and kill each other. Captain America Civil War is one of my favorite Marvel movies to watch because when these guys finally battle it out, there's years of history behind it. Captain America Civil War was released in 2016, directed again by the Russo brothers, and the whole movie is politics. It's superhero politics, like in the comic, minus, you know, most things from the comic, like the school blowing up, for instance. Let's leave that part out of this movie. But in the film adaptation, Tony sides with the government and the Sokovia Accords. He feels responsible for the death of Charles Spencer, or rather with the whole weekend of Ultron stuff. Steve wants to protect Bucky, and freedom throughout the entire team definitely wouldn't hurt either. So eventually, due to Baron Zemo's sneaky little snake work, he gets Tony in the same room as Steve, and we see footage of a brainwashed Bucky kill Tony's parents. The next 10 minutes are just filled with them both trying to end each other. Tony even blasted Bucky's arm off during this fight. He's going for blood. So Cap decides last minute to stick the shield in Tony's suit, and that shield Tony made very clear didn't belong to Cap that it belonged to his father. Coming in at number 10 is Zurinar. The Batman of Zurinar was introduced in 1958's Batman number 113 as Tlano, who protects a faraway planet in a red, yellow, and purple Batman-inspired suit. While a dazed Batman pilots the Batplane over Gotham City one night, he finds himself transported to the world of Zurinar by Tlano. Bruce helps Tlano fight off alien invaders with Superman-like powers and it's transported back to Earth. Now, fast forward to Grant Morrison's run on Batman and the whole adventure was revealed to be a hallucination caused by an isolation experiment on Bruce Wayne by the villain Dr. Simon Hurt, with Zurinar being derived from Bruce Wayne mistaking his father's last words, Zorro in Arkham, the film they had just watched before his parents were brutally snatched away from him. Using the trigger phrase, Dr. Hurt broke Bruce's mind and left him on the streets of Gotham. However, Bruce had developed a backup personality to bring the fight back to Dr. Hurt, the much more violent Batman of Zurinar. And at number 9 is Batman White Knight. Batman White Knight does something rather unique. It takes the arch enemy of Batman, the Joker, and flips him to become the hero of Gotham, but not one that wears a mask or runs around beating up criminals in the night. A hero who stands in the public eye and fights for what's right. 
mostly. The story really paints Batman out to be as brutal and terrifying as he tries to be, and it's pretty successful. The best example I can give is how the Joker actually became reformed in the first place. In the very first issue of the comic, Batman is chasing Joker alongside Barbara Gordon, Batgirl, and Nightwing, and he is single-minded, driving the Batmobile over people's roofs and through active construction zones, barging past security guards who just want to help. Normally Batman is pretty good at not letting the Joker talk him into a frenzy, but this time, it ain't gonna go that well. When Joker torments Batman, then reveals he is taking a new medication to cure his mental illness, Batman snatches the whole bottle and in front of a large group of onlookers, he empties the whole bottle into the Joker's mouth and forces him to swallow it. Number 8. Bane. There are many deranged and off the wall villains in Batman's rogues gallery. And while the Dark Knight has suffered losses and defeats at the hands of a few, none of those defeats are as infamous as the ones he suffered at the hands of Bane. By issue 11 of the Broken Bat part of the Nightfall arc, Bane had managed to find out that Bruce Wayne was indeed Batman. Bane surprised Bruce at his home, pumped himself with venom, and laid a brutal beatdown on the Dark Knight in his own home. The fight continued on into the Batcave and completely taken by surprise, Batman is on his last legs when the venom fueled tank of a man lifted Batman over his head and dropped him spine first onto his massive back breaking knee. This brutal move, captured in one of the most iconic comic panels ever, put the Batman completely out of commission, requiring him to choose another to fill his role as the protector of Gotham until he could make his triumphant return. Coming up at number 7, Alfred. Bane broke the Dark Knight's back all the way back in Nightfall, but I think it was his attempt to break Batman's spirit that was the most despicably brutal moment for this character. After Flashpoint, Batman organized a takeover of the city of Gotham, Batman and his Bat family were forced out of the city. Its perimeter was guarded and Alfred Pennyworth was taken as a hostage. In an attempt to rescue Alfred, Batman sent Damian Wayne Robin. Unfortunately, Damian was not quite capable of getting the job done, but that doesn't mean that he deserved to be forced to watch as Bane snapped the neck of Alfred Pennyworth, sending the heart of the Bat family to his grave. Instead of actually serving to break the Batman spirit like he intended to, Bane actually pushed Batman to do practically whatever it takes to put Bane down. If anything, this act united the Bat family as a force to be reckoned with, and there was no way Bane or the alternate Thomas Wayne were going to get away with this heinous crime. And at number 6 is his one rule. Batman Hush could in its entirety be seen as a brutal moment. It strikes at the childhood life of Bruce Wayne himself, pushing Batman to a point we rarely ever see. In Batman issue number 614, right smack dab in the middle of the Hush story arc, Tommy Elliot, the childhood friend of Bruce Wayne, loses his life at what seems to be the hands of the Joker. All the years and years of distress caused by the Joker, the people hurt, the lives lost, they all fuel this rage inside of Bruce Wayne who begins to lay a spectacular beatdown on the Joker, knocking out both Harley Quinn and even Catwoman who both try to stop him. Batman almost goes to the point of permanently bringing an end to the Joker, beginning to put aside his morals to finally be rid of this homicidal plague on Gotham City. It's not until Jim Gordon intervenes while Batman has his gloves around the Joker's neck that the Dark Knight finally relents. The worst part is that if Batman did go through with it, the Joker wasn't even the one responsible for the crime he thought he was responsible for. Number 5. Martian Manhunter Martian Manhunter's life since he came to Earth has been pretty good, all things considered, but his backstory is just so brutal that it earns him a spot on this list. John Jones was born on the planet Mars, where he lived with his wife and daughter. This idyllic life came to an end when John's evil twin created a virus that made Martians burst into flames when they used their psychic powers. Due to this virus, John had to watch his wife, his child, and everyone he ever knew burst into flames. When a scientist on Earth attempted to make contact with Mars with the use of a transmitter, it instead transported John to Earth where he became the hero, Martian Manhunter. He has handled the loss incredibly well, but losing everyone you ever knew in one of the most painful and brutal ways possible is simply a terrible way to live. Number 4. Guardian James Hudson of Alpha Flight has had a rough go of it. He was raised by a single mother after his father 
father was killed in a knife fight when he was just a child. He never wanted to be a superhero, but after he developed the Alpha Flight program and its chosen leader, Wolverine, left, he had no choice but to step up. His suit's power pack overloaded in Alpha Flight 12, causing him to light on fire in front of his wife and for him to be presumed dead. He was actually transported to a different planet 10,000 years in the past. The alien inhabitants tried to repair him, but confused his power suit for part of him and turned him into a cyborg before putting him in cryo sleep and sending him back to Earth. He returned after having been gone for two years and was reunited with his wife. Less than 10 issues later, he was forced to sacrifice his life in order to fight Galactic. Galactus and was considered dead again. He was actually found and captured by the evil master and brainwashed into becoming a villain against his old team. He overcame this and was finally free to live his life, until he discovered an evil plan from the government and his suit was sabotaged to send him to deep space, making everyone think he was dead again. The government made a younger clone of him that began dating his wife until Hudson came back, only to discover that his wife had broken up with his clone and was now dating his teammate, Puck. The clone later died and he was able to win Heather back, and the two had a child. But on the day she was born, a rogue government employee who wanted Heather for himself shot James out of the sky, causing him to break every bone in his body and almost die. Again. Wolverine gave him a transfusion that helped to heal him, and he was free to live his life. Until him, his wife, and his team were killed by the Collective, leaving his daughter to be raised by distant relatives. He and Heather came back to life, but their dangerous lifestyle caused the courts to refuse them custody. Heather was brainwashed by the Master into being a villain, and she killed her relatives to get her baby, causing her to become a wanted fugitive with his child. He eventually tracked them down and put them in a hollow prison where they could be safe and not hunted, but his wife made it clear that she was still leaving him. So for those counting, he's died like five times, and every time he comes back to life, his life actually gets way worse than it was before. Number three, the Hulk. Even before he became the Hulk, Bruce Banner led a pretty miserable life. His father was a violent drunk who would hurt Bruce and ended up killing his mother in front of the young boy. He threatened Bruce until he lied in court, saying that his father didn't do it, but after Brian drunkenly boasted about the crime, he was put in a mental institution. Bruce spent his childhood suffering from mental health issues, and 15 years later, Brian was released into Bruce's care. While visiting his mom's grave on Christmas Eve, Brian attacked Bruce and Bruce pushed him, causing him to crack his head open and die because of the gravestone. Bruce repressed this memory and grew up to be a great scientist. While testing his gamma bomb, Bruce realized that a teenager had wandered onto the test site and got him to safety, getting caught in the blast himself. This changed him so that whenever he became angry, he would transform into the Hulk, a giant green rage monster. He has spent much of his life since then constantly on the run and being hunted like an animal by the US military. Even when he manages to be a hero for a while, it's never long before someone decides he's too dangerous and needs to be taken out. Bruce lives a life on the run with nothing of his own, not even the clothes on his back, which he loses when he transforms. He has managed to develop a support system like his wife and Rick Jones, but between the multiple personalities and the constant battle with supervillains, he has led a pretty rough life. Number two, Deadpool. Wade Wilson was a Canadian who moved from Canada and joined the special forces in the US and later became a CIA until he fell in love with the mutant Vanessa Carlisle. Things were good for a while until he developed 34 inoperable cancerous tumors. He left Vanessa and returned home to die. He was recruited into the infamous Weapon X program and given a healing factor which caused the cancer cells to multiply, leaving him hideously disfigured. He was sent to a facility for hospice where the villain Ajax tortured him until Wade escaped and became a mercenary again. He was driven insane from all of this and became the Deadpool we all all know and love today. Although he can heal from any injury, Wade is constantly put through the ringer, being given some of the worst physical damage and torture that anyone could endure. He has trouble getting other heroes to respect him or treat him well, and had to give up his daughter because he felt that being around her would only put her in danger. He has a good heart, but there are few superheroes who have endured the amount of pain Deadpool has. Well, except of course, number one, Wolverine. Wolverine was originally James Howlett, a Canadian living in the late 1800s. When he was a young 
boy, his groundskeeper killed his father and tried to kidnap his mother. His mutation manifested at this moment, with him popping bone claws, which he used to kill the attacker. Turned out, the groundskeeper was his real father, and his mother sent him away before taking her own life with a shotgun. And it just gets worse from there. Wolverine has lived a long life, and therefore has seen almost everyone he's ever loved die, including his wife Itsu and Jean Grey multiple times. He spent many years traveling the world until he was subjected to the experiments of the Weapon X program, who gave him his trademark metal claws. In the years after this, he fought many foes and was subjected to pretty much any injury you can think of, be it having his metal skeleton pulled out or being run over by a steamroller. In a more recent example of his terrible life, he was forced to fight a group of killers who were after him called the Mongrels. He killed all of them before he was informed that every member of the team had actually been one of his children that he had conceived during his wandering years. Rough, dude. Number 10. All of this is prologue. Maybe one of the most powerful losses that I felt in recent history while reading comics came from the event AXE, Judgment Day. Not only is there the initial illusionary loss that our heroes feel, where I actually for a moment thought that they had all been killed by going for the Celestials off switch, only to find out that this was basically a ruse created by the progenitor, but when they actually all physically united to go up against the progenitor in real life and it wasn't an illusion, they failed as well. This all went down in AXC Judgment Day issue number 5, where many were killed as a result of the plan to attack the Celestial altogether and directly head on. Only a few eggs from Krakoa were able to be saved, and so bringing back some of the many who had fallen was a tough choice. For those of you who have no idea what I'm talking about, I'm talking about resurrection protocols which are happening on Krakoa, which is the mutant island right now. It left me wondering as well where this story could possibly go next. And I mean, this story was like a roller coaster. It was actually, I really liked Judgment Day. It was it was a whirlwind. And friends, before we move on to our next spot on this list, if you love what we do here at Top 10 Nerd, and if you love when we talk about brutal, brutal moments, be sure to check out our brutal playlist for even more brutality. Number nine delicious. Maybe one of the most gruesome fights to have ever happened involving Spider-Man happens against one of my personal favorite villains, Morlin. And yes, I know, there are many people out there that don't like Morlin, but I do like Morlin. What can I say? I am a sucker for vampires, even if they are weird, multiversal energy vampires that feed on animalistic totemic energy. During the other story, Spider-Man was suffering from a mysterious illness and was weakened. It was during this time that Morlin struck in issue 526 of The Amazing Spider-Man. Not only does he beat Spider-Man to a pulp here, but he also devours one of his eyeballs, plucking it out. Yeah, ouch. And also, if I may add, Ew. I also love that for this point, I literally took the quote, delicious. Number eight, be true to yourself. Be the best you are able to. Don't ever give anything but your best. This defeat wasn't a straight up defeat per se, but really a lot of that column A with just a hint of column B. During the Crisis on Infinite Earths event and issue number seven of the event's miniseries, Kara attempts to rescue her cousin Superman from the clutches of the Anti-Monitor. As the Anti-Monitor stands poised to kill him, Kara comes out swinging. Here, Supergirl proved just how fierce she can be and how determined when it came to protecting others. Ultimately, she was defeated and even killed in this fearsome fight, but at least she did succeed in destroying Anti-Monitor's machines here, and with the help of Dr. Light saving Cal. Supergirl sacrificed her life to save her cousin, but her death also served to remind him of his own mortality. Number seven, you'll only be remembered as a madman. Professor X really cannot catch a break. In almost every universe he is in, he dies at some point and usually pretty terribly. And in the case of the Ultimate Universe, he died by having his neck snapped by Magneto during Ultimatum. But hey, at least he got an on-panel death. Very few were quite so lucky during Ultimatum. Though it does feel weird to call being defeated lucky, but here we are. Xavier's famous last words to Magneto are warning him that he has gone too far, and that regardless of what he thinks he can do, wipe out the entire world as though he were a god, wash the human race from its surface, that he will not win, and in fact will go down in history as another madman. Just another madman. When Xavier compares him to the leader of Germany during World War II, however, the Chancellor of the German Reich, you know who I'm talking about, that causes Magneto to snap, which makes sense given Magneto's history. He snapped Xavier's neck in response, so while Magneto would not ultimately win the greater war here, he would win this battle, at least, pretty permanently, because, you know, 
save your stint. Number six, what a lucky man I was. I think the wild thing here is how little is said or thought in this fight. Well, I mean, there are no thought bubbles. I'm sure people are thinking, but we don't get to know what they are because, you know, this defeat comes from the battle between Superman and Doomsday, but in the animated film, The Death of Superman. So yeah, no thought bubbles here. The fight here between Superman and Doomsday somehow comes across as even more brutal and devastating to me than in the comics. Superman is choked by his own cape at one point, which Doomsday rips in the process, and when Superman is ready to give up, it is Doomsday's direct threat to Lois Lane, who tosses a rock at the brute in the midst of the fight, brave Lois Lane, that inspires Superman to get up one last time. Lois shares that she got Clark's note, and she confesses that she shares his feelings and actually loves him back. Not willing to see the woman he loves die, Superman takes one final swing at Doomsday and manages to break his neck, twisting his head all the way around, killing him. However, this final punch also seals Superman's fate, using his last bit of strength before he too perishes. In the comments on part 1, someone actually talked about how Superman's death here while fighting and defeating Doomsday in any of the versions of this story could be seen as a victory, because he did accomplish what he set out to do. And while I agree with that sentiment, because yeah, Superman does defeat Doomsday, Doomsday also robs Metropolis and the world of one of its most powerful heroes during this fight. And so in that way, Superman is kind of also defeated. I mean, he loses his life. So it's kind of like a two-way defeat when you think about it. It's bittersweet. Which to me sums up what a brutal defeat is. It's something that is often hard to watch and something that comes with usually a pretty high cost. Number 5. The Heretic The 2012 volume of Batman Incorporated is full of some just bizarre moments. This is happening at a time when Batman has taken on his newfound son, Damian Wayne, as his Robin. The relationship is strenuous at best. It's bound to happen when the dad is a brooding, unemotionally available masked man who runs around beating up criminals, and the surprise son, who was raised to be one of the deadliest assassins in the world, is dumped on Batman by a woman who had chemically manipulated him into conceiving the kid in the first place, if you know what I mean. While these two were trying to find a balance in their relationship, Talia al Ghul, the aforementioned mother, initiated a plot to take over Gotham alongside her organization and with a massive hulking bodyguard called The Heretic. Spoilers for a story that is about 10 years old, but The Heretic is actually a clone of Damian Wayne himself, and he is terrifying. For starters, he was literally grown inside the belly of a whale, which, what? But in some of his most brutal moments, Heretic ties a group of hostages to a massive boulder and then throws the boulder down a flight of stairs. He quite literally single-handedly takes the life of Knight and fights off members of Batman Incorporated using the hero's body as a weapon. But when he comes face to face with Damian Robin and Nightwing, he takes out Nightwing in one move and although Robin actually puts up a really good fight, Heretic still runs him through with a massive sword, bringing the end for Batman's son. Number Number 4. Vampire Batman When Dracula comes to Gotham, a good vampire grants Batman the vampiric gift in order to take on Dracula himself. And the idea was so awesome that it became a whole brutal trilogy. Starting with Red Rain, then Bloodstorm, and ending in Batman Crimson Mist. All of which put the most obvious hero to become a vampire in one of the best Victorian horror styles and were the most terrifying looks I have ever seen for The Dark Knight. In the first novel, Red Rain, the hero wipes out the vampires and Dracula, although he is transformed into a vampire himself at the end, which means we get to see Batman take on crime using the powers of a vampire in the next novel, Bloodstorm. He does his bestest to resist the darker aspects of being a vampire, but that all goes south when Batman lashes out and drains the Joker's blood after the Joker ended the life of Catwoman. Batman has Alfred and Gordon stake him through the heart, putting Batman into a catatonic state, a state that he is then revived from in Batman Crimson Mist, when criminals took over Gotham in his absence. This time around, the Vampire Knight is almost completely animalistic now, thanks to his isolation. A bloodthirsty vampire Batman quickly wipes out most of his enemies in brutal form, drinking their blood in the process until he is finally put to rest by Alfred, Gordon, Two-Face, and Killer Croc, who all go with him to the grave. Number 3. Arkham Asylum One of the great things about Batman compared to any other hero is the way his comics can lean really heavily on the darker aspects of human beings, and because of that they can also get away with much more expressionistic art that can be really gorgeous while also being completely terrifying. As example, let's talk about Arkham Asylum. The gritty gothic artwork, which looks like it came straight out of my nightmares, meshes with the extremely dark, disturbing, 
supernatural themes of the story to take what is essentially just Batman going to work to secure Arkham Asylum into a brutal, mind twisting funhouse ride. It's terrifying. Batman takes on some of his most well known foes, but the fights aren't the compelling part. It's the sheer freakiness of it all. The real brutality of this story comes in its horror and the dark past of Arkham Asylum itself, which is slowly drip fed to us as we make our way through the pages and pages of the most terrifying Joker I have ever seen. In at number two, All Star Batman. Remember before when I said that Batman puts the most brutal beatdowns on his opponents? Well, let's talk about a group of thugs in the All Star Batman and Robin series, specifically issue number seven. Written by Frank Miller, we can expect that this Batman will be a little bit rougher around the edges, but I don't think any of us ever expected him to be like this. In fact, this whole series is full of brutal Batman moments that honestly make him feel like a totally different character. I have talked about this before, and thank you Rodney for informing me of this, but in the opening pages of issue number seven, Batman comes speeding into a group of armed thugs, foot first, laughing like the Joker, and talking in his head about how Gotham is full of cockroaches. He's basically delighted at the fact that the criminals are so scared that they are accidentally disposing of each other. But then, on top of all of that, he sets fire to a bottle of bleach and tosses it onto the criminals, blanketing them in fire. And then he continues beating the snot out of them while they're getting crispy. This is no longer the Batman. There's no way. But wait, there's more. Because Black Canary then pops up out of nowhere and these two superheroes just start making out and getting busy while the thugs are barbecuing in the background. It's messed up. And finally, in at number one, his parents. Everyone and their moms knew this was going to be on the list. It's the whole reason Batman is Batman. The tragic passing of Thomas and Martha Wayne at the hands of Joe Chill remains the defining moment in Batman's life. It's brought up so often that you think it's basically his whole personality. And in a way, it actually kinda is. The loss of his parents has informed almost everything he has done going forward, from his decision to even become Batman, to the fact that he has such weird father-child relationships with his wards. He has paid multiple visits to Joe Chill to try and teach the man the error of his ways, and to show him what he created. He's almost constantly reminded of their loss, if not by villains who know the truth, then by his own Bat family. Bruce Wayne may have grown up to become one of the greatest detectives and superheroes in the world, but he will pretty much always just be the scared little boy in an alleyway mourning the loss of his parents. And that sucks. First up is Zeus versus Hulk. Sometimes readers need a little bit of a reminder of the power hierarchy in the Marvel Universe. And sometimes it's the characters themselves who need reminding. The Hulk went up to Mount Olympus demanding Zeus to fix stuff after a big war, and Zeus just wasn't having it, and zapped Hulk down hard. But Hulk is tough, so even after getting hit by that mega lightning bolt, he kept on going. Hulk threw some serious punches at Zeus, but Zeus hit back even harder, like super hard. Hulk got sent flying off of Mount Olympus, but even that wasn't enough. He crawled all the way back up to Zeus for round two. Zeus, no longer playing around, smacks the Hulk down so dang hard that he can't help but spew green bodily fluids all over the place. I mean, imagine shattering the Hulk's ribcage so hard that his lungs collapse. Good lord. Then Zeus really lays into the Hulk, making him crash down into the mountain where he got stuck on a rock and knocking him unconscious. When the Hulk finally awoke, he found himself chained up and left for vultures to chow down on him. Zeus was gloating, watching Hulk's super healing power keep him alive while the birds had a feast on his stomach. Classic Zeus. And number 9 is Dakin versus the Punisher. One of the most brutal fights ever involves Dakin, Wolverine's son. So Dakin goes all out on Punisher, not holding back on an ounce of his brutality. It's a story where the Punisher gets cornered and Dakin just goes berserk on him. You see, at first, the Punisher starts off okay and takes control of the fight pretty early, but that doesn't last very long. The Punisher quickly gets overwhelmed by Dakin and meets one of the most brutal ends I have ever seen in comics. Because basically, Dakin just chops him up into pieces, limb by limb, and then insults him before kicking those pieces off of the rooftop. It's gruesome. Now the scary part is that Dakin doesn't show any remorse or regret for what he's done. He's just like that, a troublemaker who doesn't hold back. And this wasn't just some trick or plan by Punisher to fake his demise. No, 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 this is the real deal. 
Later on, Dakin kind of changes sides, tries to be a hero, and joins the Wolverine family, but he's got this dark side that pops up from time to time. Like, for example, that one time when he snuck off to Krakoa to get vengeance on those who hurt innocent mutants, he's got this cruelty streak that sets him apart, making him one of the deadliest fighters in Marvel. So even though he's on the hero team now, don't forget that Dakin can be seriously deadly when he wants to be. If you're enjoying this video so far, please support the channel by pressing like, subscribing to Top 10 Nerd, and ringing that notification bell. At number 8 is Thanos vs. Black Bolt. Now, Thanos in the MCU is a pretty tough guy, able to take on Cap, Thor, and Iron Man at the same freaking time, but in the comics? Phew, he's an even bigger deal. Now let's talk about Black Bolt. He's an inhuman and his voice is crazy powerful. I'm talking one whisper from this guy can vaporize Doctor Strange and the Sentry. Yeah, the Sentry, who is basically Marvel's version of Superman. And get this, he can even wipe out an entire planet just by using his voice. Now, this guy's voice is so lethal, he's been trained not to speak, like, ever. Not even in his sleep. That's how intense it is. Now, what happens when he tries to let loose on Thanos? Spoiler alert? Nothing. Not a scratch. Thanos barely flinches. It's like watching a bug bounce off of a windshield. Thanos takes a full-on shout from Black Bolt at point-blank range, and you know what happens? Thanos sticks his arm out, wraps his hand around Black Bolt's mouth, silencing him. Then, he silences Black Bolt for good, slamming his face into the ground beneath him, repeatedly. Black Bolt, as tough as he is, has no shot here. Thanos barely even broke a sweat. It's a brutal beatdown, a real mismatch, as, as Thanos came out without a scratch. Next on the list is Captain America vs. The Punisher. During the Civil War comic arc, The Punisher was recruited on Captain America's team for all of like 10 minutes. That all went up in smoke when a couple of goons showed up asking to be a part of the rebellion. Cap was about to let them on the team, but then The Punisher lit him up with bullets before anything could be made official. And that's when Cap snapped. He wailed on Frank Castle like nobody's business. The Punisher tried to to reason between punches. After all, they were fighting over the lives of criminals, but that did not stop Cap from giving Castle the beating of a lifetime. Fists, feet, knees, shield, you name it, treated Frank like a punching bag. But the entire time, it was clear that this fight was a one-sided massacre, with Frank not throwing a single punch and Steve not pulling any of them. Then the moment came when Steve demanded Frank fight back, to which the Punisher replied, not against you, ending the fight when Cap walked away. Spider-Man theorized something about Cap being the reason why Frank became a soldier during Vietnam, which is more or less right. The Punisher exists to, well, punish people. He fights against evil, and so Captain America, being the closest thing to an actual good, noble person as anybody has ever seen, and so there was nothing for Frank Castle to punish. Captain America is the Punisher's hero, and so he just let Rogers have his way with him. Totally brutal. Number six, Jean Grey versus Cordyceps Jones. Jean Grey is a force to be reckoned with, and not just because she was the host for the Phoenix Force either. Even without the insane power of the Phoenix Force bonded to her, Jean has actually done some pretty impossible things, let's be real, including almost single handedly defeating Null during the Absolute Carnage event. Yeah, while she ultimately didn't manage that brutal takedown on her own, she was at the very least integral to beating him down the line by helping to uncover the god of the symbiote's weakness. Jean has been an unstoppable force many times over while serving on the X-Men team. She truly showed how dangerous it is to mess with her when going up against Cordyceps Jones. She defeated him and his entire casino simply by trapping him in an illusion while the X-Men basically did their thing. From within that illusion, Jean says it best when it comes to just how powerful she she is, truly, in issue 11 of the recent X-Men series. I was Marvel Girl, now I'm Jean Grey, I did not even let the Phoenix command me, so honestly, what chance do you have? Next on the list is Null versus the Sentry. In King and Black number 1, Null shows up on Earth with an army of symbiote dragons, and the Avengers are all like, oh boy, we're in trouble. The Avengers try their best to fight back, but Null is just on another level. On top of the symbiote freaking dragons, he brings these huge slaves steals covered in symbiotes and goes after Earth saying he's looking after a guy named Dylan Brock. Even when the Avengers try to bring in the Sentry, their big gun, Null straight up tears him apart and absorbs his insane powers. It's a shocker because Sentry is a powerhouse. I mean, this guy's strength is off the charts, like millions of exploding suns strong. In fact, the dude has ripped gods in half himself. So for Null to just dismantle him like he's nothing? And then to make matters worse, Null covers the Earth in symbiotes, 
blocks out the sun and plunges everything into darkness. This old dude is no joke. He proved he's basically the strongest being in the whole Marvel Universe and taking him down is gonna be one seriously tough job. Number four, Sentry versus Ares. Speaking of people ripping each other in half, Sentry is the greatest hero that Earth forgot. In the Marvel Universe, as AJ was saying, he's basically like the Marvel equivalent of DC's Superman, but quite a bit more messed up when it comes to his origins and at times his approach to fighting baddies, to be honest. In fact, Sentry himself isn't only one of Earth's greatest and most powerful heroes, he's actually also one of its most powerful and terrifying villains, as residing within him is also the persona of the Void. The Void is the reason the whole world basically had to forget that Bob Reynolds was the hero known as the Sentry. In forgetting who the Sentry was, he disappeared and with him so did his evil alter ego, the most villainous and deadly Void. Sentry, before getting himself ripped in half by Null, managed to rip Ares in half, that's how powerful and violent he can be. Of course, him getting ripped in half by Null does make sense, cause that feels like karma to me my friends. Next up is Deadpool vs the Hulk. Okay, so technically speaking, this fight didn't actually happen as this was all a twisted fantasy made up by Deadpool in his head, but it doesn't make it any less brutally mesmerizing. Deadpool, the merc with the mouth that just won't quit, is brainstorming story ideas with a comic creator in a She-Hulk-esque type sequence, where they're bouncing ideas back and forth trying to come up with something fresh and exciting for Deadpool's next adventure. About Deadpool's resilience, it's pretty insane. I mean, the dude has faced craziest stuff and managed to bounce back. Like, he's sort of like a cat with nine lives, except he's got an endless supply of lives. Boat impalement, getting ripped apart by superheroes, getting turned into a cape, you name it, he's probably survived it. So, in this story chat thing, Deadpool suggests fighting the big green Hulk. And lo and behold, the comic shows Hulk literally tearing Deadpool clean in half like he's made of paper mache. In one of Hulk's hands is Deadpool's legs and most of his torso, and in the other hand is his still screaming skull, each segment still connected by cords of his stretched tissue, and his freaking spinal column. It's the kind of stuff that makes you wince and go ouch, but it's unfortunately all in Deadpool's head. Like a what if scenario that never really happened, but it showcases just how tough and imaginative this guy can be, even when facing down the Hulk. Number two, Taskmaster versus Hyperion. This one is wild, especially when you consider the beating that Taskmaster was allowing himself to take. That's right. Right. While it might seem like Taskmaster is on the losing end of this fight here, he actually does come out on top in the end, despite getting beat down consistently throughout the fight. Spoilers. We get to learn about how he actually had this one in the bag through flashbacks that we're shown during the fight, where it's revealed that Taskmaster's preparation was basically the key here. In the Taskmaster series, in issue number two, Taskmaster is working with Nick Fury to clear his name, but Tony Masters has to basically do something for Fury first. He needs to collect the kinesic signatures of three important individuals, one of whom is actually Phil Coulson. But to get to Phil, he has to go through Hyperion, and in order to do that, he to first bring Hyperion's guard down, in essence allowing Hyperion to basically punch his way through Taskmaster so that he can do that. Ouch. Taskmaster, through feigning a loss though, is able to get Hyperion to drop his guard enough to get off a single powerful boomerang arrow shot, a Hawkeye classic to be sure, tipped with Hyperion's one weakness based on Fury's intel. So if you ever need to defeat Hyperion, just make sure you keep that on your person at all times. Coming up next is Gambit vs Captain America. Gambit, the X-Men dude who could turn anything into an explosive, has this epic face off with Captain America in AVX versus number two. So here's the deal. Cap is hunting down Hope Summers in the Savage Land, trying to prevent her from hooking up with the destructive Phoenix Force, while the X-Men on the other hand, they're all about protecting Hope, thinking that the Phoenix could be a win for mutants. Enter Gambit and Cap. Clash time, baby. When Cap and Gambit go at it, Cap's not sweating it, and even when Gambit takes his mitts off on Cap's vibranium shield, charging the shield and sending it towards Cap like a bomb, Cap dodges it easily, and the vibranium shield doesn't combust per se, but boy oh boy does it leave an explosion like you've never seen before. Then Gambit gets sneaky, charging up Cap's superhero suit, which Cap thought was off limits. Gambit essentially turns Cap's entire outfit into a ticking time bomb. Cap's duds get trashed, and he gets serious, unrelentingly advancing towards Gambit, who's throwing everything he has at him at this point. And then that's when we get the grand finale, boom! Cap's fist connects with Gambit's jaw, he decks Gambit hard, ending the tussle right there. Cap thought it would initially be a walk in the park, but Gambit pulled a pretty sneaky move. Now even though Cap won here, Gambit made him break a sweat, that's to be sure. That's how a simple tactic and a surprise move turned up the heat in this showdown. 
Number 10, defeated by the Green Goblin. Probably one of the most brutal defeats I can think of that Spider-Man has suffered was his final, or at least final at the time, fight against the Green Goblin. In this fight, which happens in the Ultimate Comics in the Earth of 1610, Peter starts off already being run down after facing the Sinister Six. To finish it off, he also must face Green Goblin, who in this reality is a hulking beast, not just a deranged and evil man on a glider in a mask. Just when it seems like Peter is about to be defeated, Defeated, even being unmasked at this point throughout the course of the fight, Mary Jane shows up to help, running into Green Goblin with a giant truck. Thanks, Mary Jane. However, this wouldn't be enough, and while Green Goblin would also seemingly perish in the end, so would Peter. Of course, both Green Goblin and Peter Parker would later return, but for Spider Man, this return wouldn't happen for some time. And even when he did at first reveal himself to actually be alive, he chose to pass his mantle on to the new Spider Man of the Ultimate Comics and Earth 1610. Miles Morales. And friends, before we move on to our next spot on this list, if you love what we do here at Top 10 Nerd, be sure to let us know that you love us by clicking that like button. Number 9, The Dimension of Spots. Oddly enough, one of the people who has been shown as powerful enough to defeat Spider-Man was actually the Spot, who most probably think of as more of like a goofy villain, and yeah, most times he kinda is. But during their first fight, he actually proved himself to be pretty powerful, even finding a way to get around Spider-Man's spider sense. This all went down in issue number 99 of The Spectacular Spider-Man, which was also when they had their first fight against one another. Spider-Man ended up being completely surrounded by spots, well, spots, and from the spot dimension, the spot punched and kicked the hero to the point that Peter found it hard to focus on his spider sense and detect where the danger was coming from to dodge it in time as it was kind of coming well, from all around him. The Spot also discombobulated Spider-Man by taking him into the Spot dimension and throwing him through another portal, another Spot, which led out to a brick wall. He left Spider-Man and Black Cat with a warning to not bother the Kingpin again or risk being destroyed by the Spot. Number 8, Spider-Man Reign. While he ultimately comes out victorious in the end, Spider-Man is temporarily defeated during Spider-Man Reign. If you aren't familiar with this story, allow me to explain. Spider-Man Reign has been described before as Marvel's version of The Dark Knight Returns for Spider-Man. In this story, Spider-Man is an elderly man who was once a florist but was recently fired. No longer a hero after years ago losing his wife, Mary Jane, and with her, his motivation to be Spider-Man, the city of New York has become a police state, controlled under Mayor Water's Iron Fist. Eventually, Spider-Man is inspired once more to rise up, but at first, when he does, the mayor responds by sticking his Sinner Six on Spider-Man. In this fight, he is joined by his old enemy, the Hypno-Hustler. However, the Hypno-Hustler is soon after defeated, leaving Spider-Man to be unmasked by Kraven, exposing New York City's hero as now an old man. At this moment, he is seemingly brutally defeated. Fortunately, though, it's only a brief defeat for this older Spider-Man. Man. At number seven, Punisher ends Doctor Doom. This one is absolutely brutal. You know, for as big as a bad guy as Doctor Doom is, it really doesn't take much for Frank Castle to absolutely obliterate him, and fairly easily too. This comes from the Punisher Kills the Marvel Universe comics. See, Castle isn't just up against Doom, but all of his Doom bots as well. However, they're all being remotely piloted by Doom, which means so long as Frank can fry the circuitry in Doom's noggin, the feedback loop easily takes care of the rest of the robots. Seriously, Doc, you should've used AI or Wi-Fi or something. All it takes is for Frank to slap a magnetic landmine on Dr. Doom's metal face, making his entire head burst into flames. But even a direct explosion to the face isn't enough to make a dent in that thick metal skull of his, so Frank results to a more brutal approach. With Dr. Doom incapacitated, Frank takes a steel hammer off the castle walls and tells Doom not to worry, as the two of them have all the time in the world. From outside of the castle walls, loud clanging can be heard like a bell as Punisher wails down on Doom's face. Clang, 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 squish. At number six is Deadpool versus an entire Armageddon. In this wild and emotional Marvel storyline, Deadpool's dad mode kicked in hard. So Deadpool, the wild and wacky mercenary, found his daughter was in danger. He had been through heaps of chaos and finally he had lost his chance at family bliss. 
But then, his daughter was alive and yet still under threat, so when the bad guys the ultimatum tried to take her out, Deadpool just couldn't take it anymore. He knew so long as he was Deadpool the Trouble Magnet, his family would never be safe, so he made a heartbreaking choice, luring all of Ultimatum, like the whole army, to a showdown. And he went absolutely berserk. He used tech from Tony Stark, blew up choppers, drove drones into the ground, and went on a rampage like no other, fighting for his daughter with everything he had, but in the end, it cost him his life. Deadpool went out in a blaze of glory protecting his family. At number 5 is Thor vs Iron Man. In the comics, you'll notice a certain god of thunder was missing from the entire Civil War ordeal. And that's because at the time, Thor was deceased, but not for long of course, because this is comic books we're talking about. Now during this time, Iron Man was kind of a big shot running the show at S.H.I.E.L.D. and taking charge after winning the first Civil War. Captain America seemed out of the picture, and Stark even went out of his way to make a clone of Thor, which he used to lie to the world, saying Thor supported his cause. But then Thor came back, and he was not happy. Iron Man rolled in, thinking he could get Thor to join his team and follow the government's orders, but Thor was just not having it, especially with Iron Man acting all bossy and making clones of him and whatnot, so Thor shows him what's what. He thrashes Iron Man's super fancy suit, striking him multiple times with lightning and leaving him defenseless. Gripping Tony by the throat, Thor reminds Tony just who's the god and who's the puny mortal. Iron Man tries to smooth things over by offering Thor diplomatic immunity for Asgard. With his most powerful suit completely trashed, Tony ends up hitchhiking a ride back to town in the back of a pickup truck. At number 4, Spider-Man vs Phoenix Colossus and Phoenix magic. So the Phoenix Force is this super duper powerful energy which got split into five pieces by Iron Man's invention during the Avengers vs X-Men brawl. These bits of the Phoenix Force energy latched onto some of the X-Men giving them crazy amounts of power like basically turning them into walking talking hurricanes of strength. Among these supercharged X-Men were Colossus and Magic, both with their powers cranked up to 11. Colossus is this big tough dude whose skin is organic steel, basically making him a walking tank. Magic, on the other hand, can teleport and has some seriously magical mojo going on. These characters are obscenely powerful in their own right, let alone powered by a fifth of the Phoenix Force. Talk about OP. Now, Spider-Man gets stuck facing these two juggernauts who are basically gods at this point. To battle them in single-handed combat would spell his doom, but Spider-Man does it anyway. He won't back down for the sake of his friends, no matter how many times he gets hit. But man, these guys were just too much for him. They pounded him hard, cracking his bones, and leaving him barely able to breathe, let alone stand. It was a complete beatdown, and it certainly was sickening. Every one of Colossus's four punches crushed Spider-Man's head to a pile of bloody pulp. His spine was completely shattered. But here's where it gets nuts. Spider-Man, even though he's all beaten up, nay, completely crushed, refuses to give in. He knows that he clearly can't outmuscle them, so he pulls a genius move, tricking Colossus and Magic into fighting each other, making them knock the Phoenix Force right out of themselves. So at the end of the day, Spider-Man emerges victorious, not because he's the strongest, but because he's the smartest and most stubborn hero around. And yeah, he is stubborn. He didn't have to do all this, but he did it to help the Avengers escape so selfless. That's why we love Spider-Man. He gets beaten many times more than you can count, but he never gives up and always manages to win somehow. At number three is Punisher vs. Wolverine. In a wild comic book series, Punisher and Wolverine tangled in a brutal showdown where Punisher, feeling cornered, went to extreme lengths to take down this unrelenting mutant. First up, he used a shotgun to blow off Wolverine's face, which is a huge deal. I mean, not so much because of Wolverine's crazy fast healing factor. Even with his face half gone, Logan was still standing, so the Punisher decided to go even further in the next issue, aiming low and wiping out Wolverine's gonads. Talk about hitting below the belt where it hurts, but then there's more! You see, the Punisher was desperate to buy time, and so he went full throttle. He didn't just stop at the face or the man parts, no, no. He rolled over Wolverine with a steamroller, squashing him flat like a pancake. Now, obviously, Logan still manages to survive, which is obviously some serious serious level toughness, but that did knock him out of the fight for a good while. Now this whole thing shows how insanely tough Wolverine is, surviving stuff that would put anybody else down for good. At number 2 is Spider-Man vs Kingpin in Back in Black. The clash with the Kingpin illuminated a different facet of the Web Slinger's character, notably during the Civil War arc in Marvel Comics. With Aunt May's life hanging in the balance due to Kingpin's orchestration, Peter found himself pushed beyond his usual moral thresholds. Striking a severe blow to the crime lord within the confines of 
a prison, Peter chose not to extinguish Kingpin's life. Instead, he dealt a far more nuanced form of retribution. In his relentless beating, Peter publicly stripped the Kingpin of his aura of invincibility and dominance. This action was more than just physical harm. It was an exhibition of psychological warfare too, revealing that the most impactful defeat can occur within the realms of perception and identity, rather than the purely physical. Though, I will say, it was physical. The message conveyed was super profound. By choosing not to end Kingpin's life, Spider-Man opted for a fate some might deem more excruciating. The knowledge of being bested in front of your peers, stripping away his veneer of invulnerability. And at number one is Magneto vs. Wolverine. Magneto vs. Wolverine in X-Men 25 was a brutal showdown. Magneto with his insane magnetic powers isn't exactly the ideal match for Wolverine. I mean, it's like pitting a Magikarp against a Jolteon. Like, come on, it's a one-sided massacre here. But Wolverine is tough as nails. He never backs down from a fight, even if it's not the smartest matchup. Now, this particular time, Magneto went all out, unleashing his full magnetic fury on Wolverine's adamantium-coated skeleton, basically ripping the near-indestructible adamantium right off of Wolverine's bones, tearing it through his flesh, leaving chunks of it sticking out from all over his body. That didn't kill Wolverine. Wolverine. His super healing factor kicked in, barely managing to get through the pain. But for fans, that was a gut punch. The adamantium was a huge part of Wolverine's identity, more than just his healing factor. It's what made him stand out, and for Mito to just yank that away so casually? It's devastating. Imagine you are Batman. You're exhausted from having faced numerous escaped criminals, coming home to your secret cave and or manor, only to find Bane, a hulking behemoth of a man, waiting to greet you. That would be terrifying, and that is exactly what happens in Batman number 497. Bane had organized a prison breakout in a secret attempt, sort of, to exhaust the Batman, to wind him down and break him down. So now, when this worn down, caught off guard Batman watches as Bane like pumps himself full of venom, the very thing that Bruce is also suffering withdrawals from, and is like talking about how Bruce Wayne is just a mask but like a useless one, but his mask is very much useful, and then he's like, so you are familiar with venom, then you know what it can do. And he like explains how his venom is way more potent, and then Batman gets like, like a bit of a good speech, like I'll give him that, it was pretty good, and he like jumps into combat, and Bane's just like, Pow! Nope, and he gives Batman an absolute thrashing. Like, he's throwing Batman around and beating the tar out of the guy, and Batman is like reliving all of his beatings up until this point, but they're like nothing like this, and Alfred literally can't even handle it, and he goes crawling off to get the Bat family, and Batman is like so exhausted that he can only try to dodge or just take the hits, but like, he goes to punch Bane, and it's like nothing, and then Bane's like, you are already broken, and then Bane just wipes the floor, the ceilings, the walls with Bruce Wayne, breaks his back, and then he leaves him destroyed on the ground. It's sick, and it's sick and twisted, but it's awesome. Next up today, the Wolverine villain Cyber is, in my opinion, kind of underrated, but he's one of the only villains to actually terrify the mutant. With some adamantium coated skin, toxic claws, and the power to track an individual's brain. Oh, and he's like nine feet tall and massive. In 1994's Wolverine number 79, Cyber is tracking down Wolverine in order to claim his adamantium bones, which he wants to then make a profit from. Unfortunately, at this time, Wolverine actually doesn't have the adamantium fused to his bones. So when the fight leads to him popping his bone claws, Cyber is a little bit disappointed. But instead of just walking away after this revelation, a cannon goes off nearby, and this gives Wolverine the opportunity to slash Cyber across the face. But as soon as the attack happens, Cyber catches Wolverine's fist and in one stomp, he snaps Wolverine's claws in half. This event scarred Wolverine, but right after it, even made him question his ability as a hero without his adamantium. Number seven, loses his marriage. Possibly one of the worst defeats is also not even a physical one. At one point, Mephisto ends up tricking Peter into giving his marriage away. Well, not really tricking him, and not really Peter alone, as Mary Jane was also one of the two to make this call, but it was still pretty brutal. Not just for Peter, but also for all of us readers. After Peter's secret identity was revealed, a hit was put out on him, but when they missed, they actually hit Aunt May instead, who ended up in critical care and was on the verge of dying. In a bid to save her life, Mary Jane and Peter traded away their marriage to Mephisto, having no choice but to do so if they wanted to keep Aunt May alive. And of course, we can't let Aunt May die. I mean, she's lived for so long. Keep her alive. 
Number 6. Losing his hand and his wife This defeat comes to us from the very brutal pages of J.J. Abrams and his son Henry Abrams Spider-Man comic from 2019. In issue number 1, we immediately start off with Spider-Man fighting against a big villain and his army of semi-organic robot specimens. We later learn that this villain's name is Cadaverous. Almost instantly, Peter's life is changed forever when we see him emerge from the rubble with a badly damaged arm. With a hand that looks like it's barely still attached to be honest, black and blue from the fight. Mary Jane rushes over to him, encouraging Peter to run. But before either of them do, the battle finds them again and Mary Jane is insta-killed when she is impaled by one of Cadaverous's impossibly long claws. Or fingers. Claw fingers. Welcome to 2019's Spider-Man. Number 5. Yeah, I always get up. Man, when it comes to tragic Spider-Man deaths, for a guy that seems to always survive just about anything, we sure have a lot of those. And into the Spider-Verse, there are multiple Spider-Men and women, Spider-Folks as I like to say. And the reality of Miles Morales, he is Spider-Man. But even in his reality, there was a Peter Parker who was the original Spider-Man. Tragically, almost as soon as Miles gets to know him and he sees that Miles also has Spider-like abilities, he's gone leaving Miles without a mentor until he meets the alternate reality, Peter B. Parker. Peter dies while trying to stop Kingpin's plot to open up portals to other dimensions, in the hopes of reviving the family that he lost. After passing on a USB key, or a goober, as it is called by Peter B., to Miles to use it to stop the collider, Kingpin and Prowler confront Spider-Man. And when Peter warns Kingpin that his plan will both destroy the world and ultimately fail in the process, or I mean at least destroy New York here, Kingpin loses his cool, slamming his fists into an already exhausted Spider-Man's chest, killing him. Number 4. This is going to hurt you a lot more than it does me. Famous words that come from Joker before he brutally attacks Jason Todd with a crowbar. This all went down in the Batman story A Death in the Family. Fans at the time were able to vote on whether or not Jason Todd would live or die. After the brutal attack on his life in issue 427 that ends with an explosion going off which buries Jason's body in rubble, in issue number 428 Eight, we'd get our answer to that fateful question. And ultimately, it would be established that Jason had, in fact, died. Although much later on we learned this wasn't quite true when he seemingly returned from the dead years later as the antagonistic anti-hero Red Hood. Number 3. You losing your cool, Brucey? This is probably one of the most brutal in terms of the devastation that was physically wrought here. For this point we're talking about Wolverine versus Hulk, but in the Ultimate Universe. And you know it's going to be brutal because it's the Ultimate Universe. Wolverine was tasked with hunting down Hulk for fury, but when he finally does find Hulk, Hulk remarks on how he really doesn't want to be found. Also proving that, you know, he doesn't really need to be disturbed because he's actually calm, he's intelligent now, and at that time of no danger really to anyone. At least not in that moment. So long as they don't, of course, goad him into getting angry, of course, which you guessed it, Wolverine purposefully does here. In response, Hulk and Wolverine begin to fight, and eventually Hulk rips Wolverine in half. And once Wolverine manages to climb a mountain to recover his legs, his lower half of his body, Hulk then threatens to eat one of Logan's legs. Ultimate universe, why why you like this? Fortunately, this pretty brutal defeat of Wolverine is interrupted by She-Hulk, who in this universe is actually Betty Ross. Number 2. What's 17 more years? While Think Mark became one of the most famous and memeable lines from this superhero defeat, an animated series, I would say, in general, one of the most brutal moments in this fight happens when Omni-Man suggests that he could basically just destroy Mark, literally kill him with his own hands, and you know, just make another child if he has to. Asking rhetorically, what 17 more years? For him as a Viltrumite, his lifespan is of course much longer than a human, so to him, 17 years is basically nothing, a very short span of time. However, reducing his emotional connection that has been built up with his son over 17 years to something so seemingly meaningless as though none of it really meant anything makes the beating that Mark takes here just even more brutal. Granted in the greater scheme of things, we know it isn't this simple for Omni-Man who, it is revealed, does love his son and is unable to actually swing the killing blow probably because of that. So. Number 1. It was a nice piece of work, Kingpin. You shouldn't have signed it. It doesn't get more awful than this defeat right here. This one happened as a greater part of the famous Daredevil story Born Again. In issue number 227 of Daredevil, we are told the story titled appropriately, Apocalypse. And indeed, if you are 
Matt Murdock, it would certainly feel like the apocalypse. Here, Kingpin finds out Daredevil's secret identity and uses it not to simply kill him, but instead to destroy his entire life. First, he comes for his law practice, making it seem as though Matt bribed a witness in a case. But he doesn't stop there. He comes after his finances, his sanity, and even blows up his apartment and, in the process, destroys his costume. However, while Dee Dee is left feeling pretty defeated by you know, that point of the whole thing when his apartment goes boom at the end of this issue, he at least now has a name to pin this all on. Seeing it all as the work of none other than Kingpin. So that's a plus, I would say. At least he has like a vendetta now. Keep him going. Number 10, Invincible vs. Conquest. Good. Ness. Invincible has a slew of fights that are extremely brutal and brilliant. I mean, their brutality is a huge part of what makes them so brilliant. This is a series that knows and understands the importance of creating stakes, both physical and emotional ones for its characters. While I considered talking about the fight between Mark and his dad Omni-Man on the first part of this list, or honestly any of the other amazing fights that happen in Invincible to be honest, as I said there are so many, I would like to specifically thank Von Soso for suggesting this one. This is the fight that happens between Conquest and Invincible. When Conquest first arrives on Earth and demands that Invincible take responsibility as the Viltrumite liaison stationed there to basically get the planet ready for conquering. Mark at this point has just gone through hell and back and basically blames himself for all of the terrible things that have happened on Earth recently. So he's not really in a great mood and is filled with anger, resentment, and sadness for all that he's lost, and decides to take on Conquest. Overall, honestly, not a great move, which Mark learns once he finds out just how powerful Conquest is. Probably one of the toughest enemies he's ever faced at this point, which is kind of par for the course for Invincible, because I feel like every time Mark faces someone, he's like, well, I've done a lot of things, and then he's always like, dang, how is this person even more powerful? How is that possible? Honestly, it's saying something, because at this point in the story, Mark has faced like a lot of tough opponents, including a whole army made up of evil versions of himself. The fight gets even more brutal when Adam Eve comes in to help, having literally flown up off a hospital bed where she was currently healing herself to do so. And I know what you all are thinking, wow, Amanda, what a number 10 spot. This is a crazy fight. But uh, yeah, that's, that's all part of the drawing you in because we got a lot more crazy fights coming up, even though this one might actually be one of our craziest. But wait for that number one spot, that one's wild. And friends, before we move on to our next spot on this list, if you love what we do here at Top 10 Nerd, be sure to show us by clicking that like button. Number 9, Deadpool vs Black Box and Black Tom. I still can't believe how close Deadpool came to dying in this fight. And the real crazy part is it wasn't even the villains really who put him in that situation. They were more like the catalysts for him putting himself in danger as he fought against them both. This one comes to us from Daniel Way's run on Deadpool which happened back in 2008. Here at one point Deadpool becomes cured of his mutation. With his healing factor gone, he is turned back into handsome Wade Wilson, but at the same time a big target is of course placed on his head when those he has royally pissed off in the past basically realize he's now very killable. Two people who end up coming for him are the villains Black Box and Black Tom. And to fight their fire, Deadpool decides to use some of his own fire, using literal fire, using a lighter and basically gasoline to create his own flamethrower. However, while he wins the fight, or while he survives survives the fight at least, I mean, can we call it, I would call it a win for Deadpool here. He ends up pretty badly injured after setting himself on fire during it. He gets a little too excited with that sort of gas station flamethrower he made and also you shouldn't do that at a gas station as we learn <laughs> in that comic. Number 8, Superboy Prime versus The Darkest Night. This one is brutal in a way that pulls at my heartstrings. This fight happens in the comic Dark Knight's Death Metal The Secret Origins. While the fight itself is pretty short, the emotional and character building implications for it are powerful. Powerful. The emotional stakes here are high. Superboy Prime ends up facing off against the Darkest Knight in the hopes of defeating him and helping to basically save the multiverse. Now, while he doesn't completely succeed here, he does help turn the tides for his fellow heroes, and this story provides a great redemption arc for Superboy Prime, who was once a hero, basically turned into a massive villain, all because he suffered the heartache of losing his world. While facing off against the Darkest Knight, Superboy Prime is basically offered to be spared and even join up with the Knight's own army of Superman. He sees a vision of a life he could have in the future where he is once more a hero, fighting alongside his other heroic colleagues if he decides to, you know, join up with the Darkest Knight who can give him that reality. However, he acknowledges that this would still not be the world he lost, noting that both his parents and Lori would still be absent here. Tempted, Superboy is grounded in reality suddenly by the reappearance of Crypto and ends up refusing the offer, fighting against the Darkest
this knight and giving his life in doing so. While the battle is not finished yet, this is a crucial moment where the tides turn for our heroes, weakening the darkness and allowing the heroes to basically rise up and end up winning the day. It is then confirmed that Superboy Prime did indeed die as a result of fighting back, however, he either gets his world back through his journey into the afterlife or possibly through the multiverse's reconstruction following the resolution of death metal. So he's either dead and then he's brought back or he's dead and he's in the afterlife and he just kind of gets a little happy ending in the afterlife. Number 7. Dazzler vs Techmaster One of the most brutal things you can do to a character, we all know, is not to just throw them brutally across a room into a wall, but literally throw them so forcefully that it looks like they were simply drawn sideways in a fight. Like someone took that figure and rotated it, which is what happens in this comic. And I was like, wow, you know that's bad. Look at Dazzler go, she's literally like this. That's what happened to Dazzler when she faced off against Techmaster. Well, Techmaster is very much, I would say, a lesser known villain, having only appeared in about a handful of issues during his time in the comics, this fight still personally had me on the edge of my seat. Honestly, a lot of classic stories have me on the edge of my seat. I just feel like the suspense <laughs> just feels so heightened. Well, Dazzler usually pulls out all her bells and whistles in a fight, in this one, she has her special portable radio made by Reed Richards, Mr. Fantastic of the Fantastic Four, destroyed, and ultimately it comes down to basically kind of like fisticuffs, as Dazzler fights desperately for survival here. She does win and even almost causes the death of her opponent as he tumbles backwards and falls over a railing. However, her manager, Harry Osgood, manages to rush in at the last minute and save the villain from certain doom, and with his life saved, Techmaster basically decides to make peace with both his rival, Harry, and with Harry's talent, Alison Blair. So it all kind of works out in the end. Number 6. Batman vs Reverse Flash This fight was heart wrenching for so many reasons, and pretty much perfectly encapsulates the kind of fights I'm excited to highlight here on this list, let me tell you. In Batman issue number 21 from the 2016 comic, part of the Button story, Batman is forced to fight against an enemy who pretty much completely outranks him, the Reverse Flash. We see him get brutally attacked and while it seems like there is no way Batman can win here, we later learn that being the smart man that he is, Batman himself knew that and so he kind of already won, simply by accepting the fact that if he fought directly, he would lose, and knowing that his best bet would actually be basically to stall until the Flash returned, which ended up being a successful and life-saving strategy, actually. Although, I mean, in the end, the Flash was still a little late, but it worked out, so yeah, and it was brutal, so it ranks. Number 5. Homelander The result of Vought American's Compound V experiments, Homelander is a narcissistic psychopath with all the powers of Superman, and is considered the most powerful man alive in the boys universe. While he is the antagonist of both the comics and the series, he is technically a superhero even if in occupation only. Homelander is extremely powerful, but considers himself above humanity, and thinks himself invincible, often using his powers to horrifically kill people who get in his way, annoy him, or even just happen to be at the wrong place at the wrong time when Homelander is bored. Some of his more brutal murders include him dooming an entire airplane filled with civilians, taking off the vice president's head, and in one issue, flying a family and their car into the sky before dropping it. He is probably the most sadistic character on this list, but since he is only considered a superhero by technicality, I put him right in the middle of the list. Number 4. Lobo Although this space bounty hunter is more often villainous than heroic, his time on the Justice League makes me comfortable giving him a spot on this list. Lobo is the last of his own species because because he destroyed everyone else in what he called a science project. He gave himself an A by the way. In his years of bounty hunting, he has destroyed several planets and countless lives, and has shown little in the way of remorse. Like Homelander, he is on this list near the middle because though he has technically operated as a superhero, there is very little about him that is actually heroic. Number 3. Ghost Rider Johnny Blaze is a motorcycle stuntman, who in an effort to save his surrogate father Crash Simpson from dying of cancer made a deal with the demon Mephisto. Mephisto promised to cure Crash's cancer in exchange for Johnny's services. Unfortunately, Crash perished in a stunt gone wrong almost immediately afterwards, and Johnny became Ghost Rider, becoming bound to the spirit of vengeance, Zarathos. When transformed into the Rider, he has super strength, is essentially immune to damage, and can manipulate Hellfire. Perhaps most iconic is his Penance Stare, which causes its victims to experience every bit of pain 
they have ever inflicted on other people, resulting in guilt, pain, and trauma. In one of the most brutal examples of the Penance Stairs power, Ghost Rider used it on a man who then broke his own neck with his bare hands to end the pain. Number 2. The Punisher Frank Castle was a Marine whose family was killed in the crossfire of a mob attack. Frank survived but was deeply traumatized, and when his family's killers went free due to police corruption, he decided to take matters into his own hands. He became the Punisher, and began using his military skills and tactics to wage a brutal one-man war on crime. His extreme methods have brought him into frequent conflict with both the villains and the heroes of the Marvel Universe. Frank has no personal life to speak of, and tends to avoid friendships in general, choosing to spend all of his time plotting, hunting, or killing criminals. He is a lunatic, with nothing to lose, but fortunately for the good people of the Marvel Universe, all of his insane fury is directed at the criminals of the city. Some of his more brutal kills include feeding a man to polar bears at the zoo, using his obese friend to smother the Russian, or kicking a limbless crime boss into a raging fire. Number 1. The Spectre The spirit of vengeance in the DC Universe first appeared in More Fun Comics number 52. He was originally a demon called Aztar, who was helping Lucifer try and take control of heaven. He eventually had a change of heart, and surrendered to the Archangel Michael. As a means of atonement, his memory and consciousness were wiped, and he was transformed into the Spectre. He is a divinely powered being, capable of almost anything he can imagine, can travel between dimensions, and can shoot energy blasts. He's immortal and capable of flight, intangibility, possession, telepathy, and telekinesis, just to name a few of his powers. In order to temper this power, he must be bonded to a human host, with this most often being Jim Corrigan. Spectre has no limit to his power, but is bound by the morality of the host, who often prevents him from unleashing the full wrath of God upon his enemies. He has killed people by aging them to death, melting them, cutting them in half with giant scissors, turning a man into a sentient and feeling mannequin who was then dumped in a fire and painfully burnt, he turned a bunch of junkies into his fingertips and then injected them with liquid fire, and in one extreme case, burnt down an entire country. Kicking off the list at number 10. Wolverine vs Hulk. This one is wild, okay? We all know Wolverine is ripped, and he gets really ripped in this one. And I don't mean ripped like jacked either, I mean ripped like in half. This one comes from Wolverine vs Hulk, and it's more than brutal. So in this story, Wolverine is sent to Tibet to assassinate the Hulk. The problem is, he's the Incredible Hulk, so it may sound easier than it looks. So when the battle between these two started up, it's loud, it's messy, and it's going to be pretty violent. Hulk picked Wolverine up and literally broke him into two, tossing his lower half up a mountain and leaving Wolverine's torso bleeding in the snow down below. Just another day in the Ultimates, you know? Being the world's greatest tracker and all, Wolverine smelt his legs that were a few miles up the mountain and then did a really slow, really painful climb to get those smelly feet back where they belong. The series was actually delayed in real life, so this journey up the mountain to get his legs back took three years for readers to finally see. Imagine if you had to wait that long to see the next episode after like a Breaking Bad finale or something. Three years? That's insane. I couldn't do it. And before we head over to number nine, guys, if you wanted to go ahead and give us a thumbs up for this video, that would be great. It helps out the studio a lot. You guys are the best. Thank you so much for watching. Now let's dive back into this list. Number nine, Batman vs. Bane. Directed by, of course, Christopher Nolan, who had done the previous installments, comes a pretty epic conclusion to the Dark Knight trilogy. Released in 2012, The Dark Knight Rises, as you can guess from the title alone, is about Batman rising up. From where? Why? What's going on? Well, how about a broken back, thanks to Bane? So this is eight years after the Joker had a run-in with Gotham City. So now Batman has returned to take down Tom Hardy as he mumbles and frowns aggressively in this film. We get one of my favorite fight scenes from any superhero movie. And what I love about this scene so much is that there's no music to it at all. All you hear is Batman legitimately struggling to try and fight this dude. And it makes it more realistic. <laughs> It's stressful, and you can see Bruce become more and more exhausted by each punch, and it all comes to a screeching halt when Bane picks up Bruce for one last blow, right to the spinal cord. Spirit! Oh, your money! 
Now, I know people like to give this movie a hard time, but seeing Batman get his ass kicked like this reminds me that it's not always the hero that gets the last punch. Number eight, Magneto vs. Wolverine. Look, I'll be honest, I'm a nail biter, okay? And there's days where I can't even muss up the strength to pull a hangnail out of my own finger or whatever. It sucks, I can't deal with pain, especially when something's coming out of my body, which makes the next one on this list really brutal for me to read. Now, I couldn't imagine if all my bones were suddenly ripped out of my body. That's a nightmare. And that's exactly what happens to Wolverine when Magneto has had enough of his nonsense. Yeah, this all takes place during the Fatal Attractions event. So Wolverine doesn't even have a chance to scream. The adamantium that bonded to his bones erupted outwards like water bursting through a dam. And he's still breathing when this happens. I mean, if this isn't one of the worst things to go through, I couldn't tell you what is. Definitely not one of my hangnails. This one is probably a little bit more painful. Thankfully, thankfully, Xavier wiped Magneto's memory of the whole event and Wolverine was out of commission for a while recovering. I mean, he had mental spikes sticking out of his body. I don't think he's gonna get any chores done in the meantime. Number seven, the Avengers vs. Thanos. The Russo brothers came in the MCU with the Winter Soldier and we got that sick, awesome elevator scene and then we got Civil War. They make some pretty fun movies. My personal favorite of the bunch is still Infinity War. I mean, all these characters who led their own franchise crammed into one single movie shouldn't have worked out as well as it did. It's a smooth flick. So we see Thanos as he walks his way through the universe collecting the cosmic infinity stones. First, he decimates Xandar for the power stone, gave Loki the old one to choke for the space stone, and then he punched the Hulk so hard in the neck that he quit being the Hulk. And this is like the first 10 minutes of the movie. So the movie itself is a brutal fight, but of course it comes down to the last stone, the last attempt the Mind Stone, the stone that is Vision, it's in his forehead. So after a last effort attempt of removing the stone in Wakanda, Wanda Maximoff is forced to destroy it. So while she's working on that, all of our Avengers are getting destroyed by the powers that Thanos now obtains, but they don't come out on top in this one. Vision gets that big yellow black head pulled right out of his forehead, and then the theater sat silent, and we just watched Vision's lifeless and colorless body fall to the ground. Seeing the Avengers lose like this, especially Vision, was definitely one of the more brutal beatdowns in an MCU movie. Number six, Noel versus Thor. Spoilers coming in hot for King and Black by Donny Cates, okay, just so you guys are aware. So during the first battle with Noel and his army of symbiotes, Thor was not to be found. The God of Thunder would be a perfect fight considering the weakness of the Horde being electricity and magic. Kind of makes sense. He'd be a pretty reliable chess piece to this violent game, no doubt about it. So when the God of Thunder finally arrived in issue three of King and Black, he brought a pretty epic battle with him. So Noel had come to Earth with his thousands of symbiote dragons searching for Eddie Brock's son, Dylan. He's searching for you, Dylan, they're coming, man. And when he finally got a hold of Eddie, he stripped him of the symbiote and dropped him from the Empire State Building. Things are looking not so great. And then Thor returns finally in the next issue. So you're a God and a King, Thor asks. Good for you. Now allow me to teach you what those words truly mean. And he does just that. Of course, with the help of Tony riding in on an extremis infected symbiote, it's just another week and a bit and we'll see this epic battle continue with issue four. But so far, it's up to a crazy, crazy awesome start. Number five, Hulk gets indigestion. In the alternate timeline that belongs to old man Logan, we witness a potential future where Logan lives on land with his wife and two children that is owned by the Hulk gang. The Hulk gang are multiple generations of Hulk's inbred family. Bruce himself is still alive and demands doubled rent from the Logans. Old man Logan sets out to collect this rent before the due date when his family is threatened, but unfortunately does not make it back in time, despite him actually arriving early in regards to their originally agreed upon date. Logan finds his family has already been killed in his absence and sets out hell-bent on revenge. Unfortunately, Logan doesn't seem to be much of a match for Hulk, who devours him. Of course, Logan may have actually been counting on that happening. While Hulk's body attempts to digest him, Logan pops his claws and cuts his way out of Hulk's stomach. We've seen Wolverine attempt this move a couple of times in the comics, but it doesn't get any less gruesome anytime he does it, especially with Steve McNiven on pencils. Number four, Nova brutally disembowels Annihilus. This has got to be one of the most violent kills we've seen in the pages of a Marvel comic. During Annihilation in issue 6, we saw Nova, aka Richard Ryder, take on Annihilus and succeed in defeating him. But he didn't just defeat him, he disemboweled him. And not in a conventional way either, but by reaching down his throat, that's right, the brutal and violent end happened by Nova punching down 
into Analysis' throat so far in fact that he somehow reached his organs. I don't know how that scientifically works, but there you go. And he pulled specifically what appeared to be his intestines out through his mouth. Quite intense. I don't think you can actually do that to someone, but I'm not gonna ask if it's possible because I don't wanna know. Number three, Wolverine kills everyone. Not intentionally though. In this instance, he was tricked. During Mark Miller's Old Man Logan limited series, it was revealed that Mysterio tricked Wolverine into killing nearly everyone in the X Mansion. The staff, the students, his fellow colleagues, the X Men. There were even more deaths as the supervillains took over the world, leaving us with the dystopian future that we see in this series. But by far, the thought of Wolverine Wolverine slicing up everyone that he ever considered to be close enough to consider family, believing they were intruders and that he was protecting his own fellow mutants in doing so is shocking. Also just him holding Jubilee, I was like, no. Number two, Black Panther becomes zombie food. In the Marvel Zombies world, Black Panther was one of the sole survivors when the zombies first attacked and turned most of his friends into zombified versions of themselves. One such former friend, Hank Pym, actually just managed to trick T'Challa into coming with him. Or, well, he almost did. He just almost, so close. Either way, Hank managed to incapacitate T'Challa, having already begun Begun to change himself. He used Black Panther, his friend, as a food source, keeping him locked away and alive, sawing off pieces of him, and slowly devouring him. Fortunately, Black Panther would escape and even become the leader of a land of survivors, although he would eventually turn into a zombie himself much later on. But that's a story for another time. Number one, Pop goes Doctor Strange, or his head. Ew. For this gory moment, we head to Ultimatum. I know, I'm sorry, but sometimes we gotta go back there. Now in Ultimatum, Doctor Strange took on an enemy that we've seen in battle multiple times before in the comics, Dormammu. And usually win against Dormammu even, but not this time. This time it was Dormammu who reigned victorious after using Doctor Strange's cape to strangle him to death by wrapping tightly around him. So tight in fact that Strange's head exploded. There are a lot of cons for wearing capes in a fight in terms of practicality. I know this, but this has got to be one of the most horrific instances of one that I've ever seen in the comics. Number 10, Rorschach. Walter Kovacs had a pretty rough upbringing, being raised by a less than ideal mother before being made a ward of the state. He was bullied there too, although through his schooling it was discovered that he was an extremely intelligent boy with a real skill at boxing. When he grew up, he became a garment worker until the murder of a woman who was killed in front of several witnesses, who all didn't even try to help her, inspired him to become a costumed crime fighter. He used a special fabric that changed with temperature and pressure to make a mask for himself and he became Rorschach. Rorschach was a decently respected hero, even working with the other heroes as a member of the hero team the Crime Busters. But after seeing a particularly cruel and disturbing crime scene, his mind snapped and the Walter Kovacs side of him died, leaving only the brutal Rorschach. Rorschach has been known to treat the criminal element with complete disdain and cruelty, having no qualms about using intense violence in his interrogations. Like when he crushed a drinking glass in a man's hands. He is lethal to his enemies, having dropped men down elevator shafts, set men on fire, burned them with cooking oil, electrocuted them, and drowned them in toilets without showing the slightest bit of remorse. Number nine, Wolverine. You know who Wolverine is. He's the fuzzy Canadian with a healing factor who was experimented on by the Weapon X program and given adamantium claws. He has been a member of several superhero teams such as the X-Men, X-Force, and the Avengers, but he is much more brutal than a lot of his teammates. I mean, he has knives coming out of his hands. That obviously makes him pretty brutal. But considering this, he does try to restrain himself from being too violent. Unfortunately for his enemies, he has a tendency to fly into a berserk rage where he becomes a flurry of claws and anger. I could sit here and tell you specific examples of his brutality, but pretty much all of them just boil down to him using his claws to leave rooms full of corpses that have been cut into a bunch of tiny pieces. Number 8. Spawn Al Francis Simmons was a mercenary for the US government before being killed by one of his fellow mercenaries. Due to all the murder, Al was sent to hell, but he made a deal with a demon named Malebolgia and agreed to join Hell's army as a hell spawn. 
Babylon. He was sent back to Earth where he discovered that five years had passed and that his wife had remarried and started a new life with his best friend. So he became Spawn and spent the rest of his time brutally dispatching violent criminals and fighting evil demons. He can use his demonic powers to go up against his enemies, but he is just as likely to use his bare hands to straight up tear people in half, or in one case, stab someone to death with an ice cream scoop. Number 7. Dog Welder Dog Welder is a member of the DC Super Team Section 8, which consists of some of the intentionally worst superheroes in comic book history. There is Six Pack, who is a drunk man who attacks people with a bottle, Defenestrator, who carries around a window pane that he breaks over people's heads, or Bueno Excelente, who, well, the less said about him, the better. One of the more brutal members of this lame team is the Dog Welder. He never speaks, and his whole deal is setting up traps in alleyways to capture and euthanize dogs. He then carries around the dead dogs until he comes across a villain. Then he uses his welding torch to weld the dog to the villain's face. That's it. That's his whole deal. And he has only made six appearances in the history of DC, although in one of them he did weld a dog to Lobo's butt. Number 6. Moon Knight When Mark Spector was a child, he discovered that his rabbi was actually a former German SS officer who had deserted at the end of the war and was posing as a rabbi in order to end the lives of members of the local Jewish community. Mark escaped, but the trauma of this caused him to develop dissociative identity disorder. His first alters were Stephen Grant, who invested Mark's meager funds and became a millionaire who funds their superhero activities, and Jake Lockley, a rough and tumble cabbie who uses his position to gather intel on the various crimes going on. Mark became a mercenary, and after having been critically injured, made a deal with the god Khonshu to become his fist and punish evildoers in his name. He developed the superhero personas of Moon Knight as well as Mr. Knight, who is also a hero but wears a posh white suit rather than a big white cloak. Moon Knight can be brutal with his enemies, often branding them with his logo or straight up killing them. Some of his worst moments include gouging the villain Truth's eyes out or ending his battle with Raul Bushman by cutting off the guy's face. Number 5. Harley Quinn vs. the Joker Well, some still might think of Harley Quinn as a villain, this all happened I would say around the time of her turning point from kind of villain into heroes, kind of when it's all going down. And while the road has been long, I would say at this point in time, at the time of this recording right now, despite only a few years before being declared villain of the year, that Harley is more hero than villain right now in her history. So yeah. This fight happened however quite a while ago now, but Harley was still enjoying acting somewhat heroically, at least, as part of the Suicide Squad, and coming into her own really as a character, or continuing to come into her own I would say. In Suicide Squad issue number 15, she faces off with the Joker in one of the most brutal fights I have ever read. And while the Joker technically kinda wins this fight, Harley wins the battle, managing to escape with her life after he locks her up and threatens to leave her there to starve to death with all the corpses of the supposed Harleys who came before her. There is so much about this fight that I cannot talk about in detail because we're on YouTube. But just trust me, it's it's just because it's also literally that brutal. So if you want to read a brutal fight, check it out. Number 4. Spider-Man vs Green Goblin This one ended in seeming death for both parties, and it doesn't get more brutal than that. Add in the fact that Peter Parker was also unmasked during the fight, and had his loved ones and neighborhood watching him get basically beaten into oblivion, and it creates a pretty intense picture in your mind. And in your heart. Or well, yeah, I mean you don't even really need to create a picture of it in your mind, because this comes from the Ultimate Comics, and of course they provide the pictures for you, because it's a comic book. And what a brutal picture they do paint. This fight isn't just brutal in a physical sense, although it is also that, with Peter smashing a hulking green goblin with basically a semi truck at one point, but it's also brutal in the emotional sense, because it ends with Peter's apparent death. And I mean also goblins apparent death. But of course, I'm much less broken up about Green Goblin dying here. No one cares. <laughs> Norman, you deserved it. In fact, I kind of feel relieved at that part. While this wouldn't be the end end for either character, this battle is still one that stands out to me as one with heightened stakes, where the characters feel right on the precipice of death almost throughout, until they actually and tragically cross over to the other side. Number 3. Batman vs Superman An iconic fight in the comics that made its way to the 
big screen. Granted, on the big screen, I don't know how iconic this fight was for me, but at the end of the day, the fact that it even made it there just goes to show the impact it had on readers. This fight doesn't even come from the main continuity, hailing instead from Frank Miller's The Dark Knight Returns continuity of Earth 31. But it was so brutal and impactful that it was still incorporated into the main continuity, or the likely, I guess, to be former main continuity of the DCEU. Here, two heroes fight against one another, and one of them doesn't even have any powers to speak of. Batman, at this point, is not only still powerless, but is also, or I guess was also, retired. He returns from retirement, however, and as a result, Superman is basically tasked with taking him out by the precedent. But Batman isn't prepared to go down without a fight, and a bloody, brutal, and desperate battle ensues between the two at the end of the story that we later find out Batman seemingly won in his own sly Batman way. While Batman seemingly dies and is unable to finish the fight with the strain being too much on his heart and him collapsing, we later learn at the funeral that he is still alive and well, and that Clark may have even been in on this ploy. At the very least, he seems to be in on it by the end of the story. Number 2, Hawkeye versus the Liberators. As you'd expect, this list wouldn't be much without me diving into the world of the Ultimates. And what a perfect time for it too, as the Ultimate line is due to make its return in comics this year. There's so many brutal fights in the Ultimates, with Jonathan Hickman heading the return of the Ultimates line. Like many, I too am excited about this, so I thought why not dive back into some of the most brutal Ultimates fights we've ever witnessed. This one comes to us from before Jonathan Hickman's time working on the line, but was delivered to us by the dynamic and often brutal duo of Mark Miller and Brian Hitch. And Brian Hitch will be returning, so fun facts. It does fit right in on this list because it's just that brutal. The fight happened after Hawkeye of the Ultimates team was kidnapped by the Liberators. After learning of what happened to his family and being mocked, tormented, and questioned, Hawkeye finally manages to strike back against his captors with the only weapon he has at the time, his fingernails. And we're not talking about Clint clawing his way out of this. Oh no, we are talking about him using his fingernails as projectiles when combined with his deadly accuracy, which basically allow him to take out an entire group of liberators and successfully escape. He kills people with his fingernails. Number 1, Mera versus Aquaman. Mera and Aquaman are often presented as being romantic partners and sometimes as a crime-fighting Atlantean duo as well. However, this doesn't mean that they never fight. And during the Blackest Night, they actually had some pretty good reason to. At that time, Aquaman had been possessed by the Black Lanterns joining their forces and Mera was driven into a rage by the death of the last standing family member she had, Tempest, causing her to become a Red Lantern. During one page in Green Lantern issue number 50 from the 2005 volume of that series, Mera takes on the deceased Arthur Curry, and when he attempts to win her over through what I can only describe as weird kind of empathy, I imagine trying to distract her from her rage by attempting to bond with her over the loss of their son. This however fails to work, and Mera frightens him off masterfully, responding I never wanted children, before seemingly killing them both with her blood, which is a Red Lantern was transformed at the time into liquid napalm, because that's how it be for Red Lanterns. Number 10, Batman. Batman is perhaps the poster boy for miserable superheroes. When he was a child, he of course saw his parents die in front of him, causing him to vow to protect Gotham City from crime as Batman. Batman has witnessed many tragedies during his time in the cowl, and has had his fair share of horrible things happen to him, such as losing one of his sons, Jay as well as his father figure and faithful butler, Alfred. He has also had to deal with several horrible injuries, such as being repeatedly shot and stabbed, and having his back broken. He also got left at the altar on his wedding day, which was not great for his mental health I'm sure. Despite being a character who is very much defined by what he has lost, he has probably gained more over the years. He has a massive family of both biological and adopted children, and has an extensive collection of allies and friends. On top of this, most of the things that he has lost have come back to him over the years. He lost Jason Todd, but he returned to life. The same thing happened when he lost Damian Wayne or Stephanie Brown. Out of all the major losses, the only ones that have stuck are his parents and Alfred. And let's face it, Alfred coming back is only a matter of time. Batman's life is better than he lets on. 
and he's probably just depressed, which is why he's at the bottom of this particular list. Number 9, Angel. Warren Worthington III was one of the original X-Men, having giant bird wings that allowed him to fly as Angel. He spent years as a hero until the mutant massacre. He was captured by the Marauders, who then cut off his wings and crucified him. This caused him to spiral into an awful depression, which eventually led to him trying to take his own life. This was prevented when Apocalypse showed up and made Angel an offer. He would give him back his wings if Angel would become one of the horsemen of the Apocalypse, the Archangel of Death. This got him his wings back, but caused a host of other problems with him having to work to resist the evil force that was put inside him ever since. Number 8, Scarlet Witch. Wanda Maximoff has gone back and forth between hero and villain during her many years at Marvel Comics, with her being responsible for a lot of horrible things that have happened, such as the infamous No More Mutants thing. But that is not to say that she hasn't had a somewhat tragic life herself. Things didn't get off to a good start when she was kidnapped from her mother as a baby by the High Evolutionary who experimented on her to give her powers. While staying with old H.E., a demon named Cthon chose her to be his vessel, trying to possess her multiple times. She tried to put out a fire in her village with her powers, and people assumed that she was the one who started it and attacked her. This led to her being saved by Magneto and joining the Brotherhood of Evil Mutants. She eventually became an Avenger and married her teammate Vision. She she used her powers to create a pair of twin boys for her to raise. This made reality unstable, and Wanda was forced to give them up, and they faded from existence. This led her down a dark road where bad stuff continued to both happen to her and because of her. She has had a far from easy life. Number 7, Spider Man. Spider Man lost his parents when he was a young boy, and he was sent to live with his aunt and uncle. When he developed spider powers, he chose not to stop a criminal who went on to kill his uncle Ben, and as a result, he became a superhero with a guilt complex named Spider-Man. Spider-Man has certainly had his fair share of losses with his parents, his uncle, and his first great love Gwen Stacy, who got thrown off a bridge and died from whiplash when Peter tried to catch her with a web line. He's had some major wins as well though, having dated some of the most absurdly attractive women in comics, and getting married to his perfect partner, Mary Jane Watson. Although, this was undone in a deal with a demon in order to save Peter's Aunt May. Since then, it's been a downward spiral, with Marvel editorial seemingly being unwilling for Peter to grow as a person. They let him and Mary Jane become pregnant, but then made the child a miscarriage at the last minute. They undid his marriage, they made him the head of a big company which he then lost, he became a teacher but was fired. It seems like any time he's about to move into a new era, something happens that makes him single, broke, and taking pictures of himself for the bugle for money. He has a less intense series of losses than a lot of of the others on this list, but it's just a constant stream of pain and anguish for the poor guy. Sometimes to the point that it doesn't even make sense. He recently broke up with Mary Jane, and six months later, she's with some guy named Paul, and some kids are calling her mommy. Spider Man is known for having a rough life, but Marvel needs to let him be happy for a bit, just for something different. Number six, Daredevil. Daredevil is another character who almost notoriously can't seem to catch a break. When he was a child, Matt Murdock was in an accident that caused a radioactive isotope to get in his eyes, blinding him. It also gave him heightened senses and amazing abilities, but life wasn't through with him yet. His father was a boxer who refused to throw a fight, for which he was killed, leaving Matt with no family to speak of. He became Daredevil as well as a lawyer, but it has been far from an easy gig. One of his loves, Elektra, was killed by the villain Bullseye, as if that wasn't bad enough, Bullseye would later end the life of Matt's other great love, Karen Page. Speaking of Karen, she was an addict who sold Daredevil's secret identity for a fix, which allowed the Kingpin to systematically destroy Matt's life. It eventually got back on track, and Elektra eventually returned to life, but Matt has had to deal with his secret identity getting leaked constantly, getting possessed by a demon that made him murder people, being sent to prison multiple times, and having an almost constant tension with the people who care about him. On top of of all of that, he has massive Catholic guilt, which just makes everyone feel worse. Number 5, Doom versus Thanos. Somehow, my fellow nerd compatriots have failed to recognize the sheer might and power that is Doom. Victor Von Doom has some of the best moments in Marvel Comics, and some of the beatings he puts down on other characters throughout are definitely worthy of this list. When Doom was ruler of Battleworld in the most recent Secret Wars event, very, very, very few could challenge his rule. But one who was foolish enough to do so was the Mad Titan Thanos. Thanos, being the rightly smug, extremely powerful Mad Titan he is, decides to challenge Doom's 
straight on and refuses all of Doom's offers to just work with him. Thanos goes on a little rant about how when he had the Infinity Gauntlet, he acted as a god and he called Doom a weak god. In retort, Doom goes, Hmm, and do you have the Infinity Gauntlet now? To which Thanos replies, I do not, but I remain Thanos the Great Tyrant, and for you, that will be enough. That was stupid, because then, in one quick move, Doom simply plunges his hand into Thanos' chest, grabs a hold of his spine, and turns his body to ash as he says, that appears untrue. And it le it's just one of the greatest comic book panels I have ever seen. Number 4, Doom vs. Spider-Man. Carrying along the Doctor Doom hype train, in Amazing Spider-Man Volume 1, number 349 and 350, Doctor Doom and Spider-Man faced off, and it did not go well for the wall crawler. This time, Spidey was tracking a jewel thief named the Black Fox, but the Black Fox also had a certain Latverian ruler hot on his tail as well, as he had also bartered one of Victor Von Doom's family heirlooms, an emerald passed down to him by his late mother. And if you know anything about Doctor Doom, you never mess with anything related to Dr. Doom's mama. Doom flew to New York and just happened to catch up with the Black Fox at the same time that Spider-Man did. When Spidey intervened on the Black Fox's behalf, Dr. Doom did not hold back. Doom nonchalantly thrashed the web-slinger, leaving him with his costume in tatters and desperately scrambling away for his life. While he convinced Doom to allow him time to retrieve his family heirloom, Peter's severe beating had left him concussed, so much so that he even hallucinated Uncle Ben. The beating he took taught Spidey an important lesson about recognizing his limits. Coming in at number 3 today is Doctor Doom vs Reed Richards. But alas, Doctor Doom is a villain and therefore he has been defeated quite a few times. Quite possibly up there as one of the best one on one fights between Doctor Doom and his nemesis Mr Fantastic came to us in Fantastic Four 1961 number 200 when these two college rivals resorted to a battle of fisticuffs. It was intense with Doom characteristically monologuing the whole time, even with Richards using his elastic body to try and overwhelmed Doom, he fought Richards off, pummeling the man and eventually getting his metal gloves around Reed's throat. Unfortunately, one of Doctor Doom's biggest weaknesses is his own face. Thanks to his power source short circuiting, the lock to Doom's mask was weakened, giving Reed the chance to pull it off, revealing Doom's face to a room full of mirrors. The lenses from Doom's mask couldn't protect him from the solar powered intensified reflections and drove him just a little bit bonkers. On one hand, Doctor Doom beat the snot out of Reed Richards, but Reed psychologically crippled Doctor Doom in one fell move. Number 2 Black Tarantula vs. Spider Man. So showing up in The Amazing Spider-Man 432, Black Tarantula seemingly attacks our spider hero out of nowhere, chucking half a chimney at him as his first move. Now while Spider-Man tries to figure out who the heck this guy is and why he's even after Spider-Man, he is dodging out of the way of optic blasts, massive punches, and even his own webs do nothing as Tarantula just rips through them like tissue paper. Spider-Man even has a whole flashback about how Mary Jane wanted him to quit being Spider-Man, which was interrupted as Black Tarantula smashes through the wall Spider-Man was standing on. Spider-Man ends up floating down to an alley and while he gets maybe two or three punches on Tarantula, when the villain gets his hands on Spider-Man's ankle, it's all over. He slams Peter between the alleyway walls, then down onto the pavement, and then he literally rips off Peter's mask, revealing his bruised face, before telling him that he is sparing him so he can find Norman Osborn's missing child, but when he has done so, Spider-Man needs to leave New York for good. He then just walks off, leaving Peter in the fetal position, counting his injuries and thanking his lucky stars that he is alive. And finally, in at number one today is Moon Knight vs. Bushmaster. During Charlie Houston's 2006 run of the Moon Knight comics, in the second issue, Mark Spector recalls how he ended up in a wheelchair. And it was all because of his little fight that he had with his nemesis, Bushmaster. In a flashback, the two are brutally fighting each other along the rooftops until Bushmaster savagely throws Mark off of the roof and he crashes down, bouncing on and off of a fire escape below, breaking and crushing both of his knees at the same time. It is brutal with a capital B. But this is Moon Knight. Thinking he'd won, Bushmaster comes in for the final hit, but Mark lands multiple crescent darts deep in the villain's neck. But then, Mark isn't finished. He then climbs on top of his nemesis and using another dart, he relieves Bushmaster of his own face, giving him a look that resembles what his mask used to be, a face with the skin removed. Number 10, Taskmaster versus Hyperion. This one is wild. 
wild. Especially when you consider the beating the Taskmaster was allowing himself to take just to get this fight done. And yet he did manage to get it done. And impressively so. We get to learn about how he actually had this one in the bag through flashbacks we are shown during the fight, where it's revealed that Taskmaster's preparation was the key. Now it might seem weird that I'm considering Taskmaster to be the hero in this case, but based on what we learn about Phil Coulson's Squadron Supreme in the 2021 Heroes Reborn event and you know that whole thing with Mephisto, it really does make sense based on that. In the Taskmaster series in issue number 2, Taskmaster is working with Nick Fury to clear his name, but Tony Masters has to do something for Fury first. He needs to collect the kinesic signatures of three important individuals, one of whom is Phil Coulson. But to get to him, he has to go through Hyperion. And in order to do that, he has to first bring Hyperion's guard down, in essence allowing Hyperion to punch his way through Taskmaster. Ouch. Taskmaster, through feigning a loss though, is able to get Hyperion to drop his guard enough to get a single, powerful boomerang arrow shot out. A Hawkeye classic that is tipped with Hyperion's one weakness based on Fury's intel. Radioactive Argonite. Which is basically like Hyperion's like kryptonite, so yeah. Alright friends, before we move on to this next spot on our list, if you love what we do here at Top 10 Nerd, why not show us you love us by clicking that subscribe button. I know there's a lot of you out there that aren't subscribed. I'm looking at you. You're not subscribed. Go click it. Do it. I'm gonna wait. Okay. Thank you. Number nine, Dream versus Karanzan. One of my favorite fights I've ever read in any book, comic, or otherwise happens in the Sandman series, where many of my favorite things happen in comics because it's one of my favorite stories of all time. If you've watched my videos on Nerd Here regularly over the years, you may also know that this comic is one of my favorite stories of all time because anytime I can talk about it, I love to talk about it. The original comic, of course, from the 90s is what we're talking about here, and the fight that happens in it happens during the first arc in the series when Dream is tasked with reclaiming his symbols of office, namely here his helm, which it turns out is currently in the possession of a demon in hell. In order to get back his helm in the comics, he must do battle with and beat the demon currently in possession of it, one of Beelzebub's a demon named Karanzon. This battle is described as being the oldest game and is in essence a battle of imagination. One can lose through hesitation, inability to take up a solid defensive stance, and of course Course, lack of imagination. In the Sandman live action series, this is the battle we see that takes place instead between Lucifer and Dream. However, in the comics, it is Karanzon that conjures up the anti life in the hopes of finally beating Dream. While initially Dream is badly beaten by Karanzon's move, he ends up winning in the end, proving himself really the ruler of imagination, as what else are dreams really, by conjuring up the concept of hope which obviously can be pretty much everything. Some people might not consider Lord Morpheus a superhero, but I would consider his tale overall to be one similar to that of a heroic epic. And for that reason, and his capacity to do great good when he so chooses, I'm gonna include him here. Number 8, Moon Knight vs. Raul Bushman. So many of the most brutal fights in comics I feel like come from the time period that this comic does, the early 2000s. One of the most edgy times other than the 90s. In Moon Knight issue number 2 from the 2006 volume, Moon Knight takes on and brutally defeats Raul Bushman. But even before we get to the brutal yet victorious literal face off moment, stakes are established here, with Moon Knight being pushed off of a rooftop and falling to his doom, or seemingly falling to his doom, smashing his knees as he goes, and therefore unable to get up to defend himself really when Bushman comes down to finish the job. Fortunately, Moon Knight has his crescent moon darts and uses these to bring Bushman down to his level so he can crawl over to him and finish the job. Number 7, Black Panther vs Namor. Probably one of the most brutal fights I've ever seen on screen in the Marvel Cinematic Universe comes to us from the recent Black Panther sequel, Wakanda Forever. That's right, we're going to the MCU baby. In this film it is T'Challa's sister Shuri who takes up the mantle of Black Panther after her brother passes away. Which was changed in the script after the real world death of Chadwick Boseman who initially played Black Panther. Prince turned king T'Challa in the first film and in the MCU. Shuri here takes up the mantle 
mantle as a last resort to reconnect with the family she has lost, but also because she knows it is the only way she will be able to fight against the newly introduced and complex antagonist in this movie, Namor, the Submariner, or Namor if you prefer. I love the way that it's said in this movie, Namor. When the two do come to blows, after Shuri does successfully recreate the heart-shaped herb and becomes Black Panther, Shuri also uses her smarts to take advantage of Namor's weaknesses, creating a device to dry him out, which she places in one of her ships and activates during the fight against the famed Talo Khan. During the fight, the airship crash lands on a desert looking beach. It looks real crispy down there, I gotta say. And the two continue their bloody fight, both almost dying as Shuri attempts to prevent Namor from getting back into the water. Through the course of their fight, Black Panther rips off one of Namor's ankle wings, which allows him to fly, and Namor at one point skewers her with a part of the wreckage. Or a spear, I'm not really sure what it is. Looks like a spear, but he also kind of grabbed it from where like the wreckage was. Maybe there were spears on the ship, who knows. Number 6, Thor versus Kull Borson. Also known as the Serpent and the God of Fear, Kull Borson is actually Thor's uncle. But that didn't stop these two from fighting one another. In fact, their fight was in essence destined to happen. It had to happen, and Thor was fated to die in this battle against his uncle. Odin had attempted to keep Thor safe from this prophecy by locking Kull away years ago. Kull was once actually the rightful ruler of Asgard, the Allfather. But Odin was forced to overthrow his brother after Kull became obsessed with striking fear into both the hearts of his enemies and even kind of his allies. Odin locked Kull away deep beneath the sea, hoping to keep him from ever becoming powerful enough to rise again after he learned that the serpent was prophesied to kill his son. However, even doing this could not prevent the prophecy from coming to pass. Eventually, Kull would rise up, powered by the fears of the people of Midgard, and choose his own champions, awarding them great power and each their own hammer. Thor would learn the truth of his uncle and with the Avengers do battle against him and his army, dying as predicted in the fight against his uncle, but fortunately defeating him too. However, this is also comics, so both Kull and Thor would eventually return, despite their epic showdown and its seemingly permanent results. Number 5, Punisher vs Wolverine. I mean these two are both superheroes, which is maybe what makes the fight so much more brutal. This one happened during Garth Ennis's and Derek Robertson's time on Punisher. Here Punisher and Wolverine end up in a kind of a reluctant team up or a team up gone wrong I would say, when Wolverine questions Punisher's methods here. As a result, to prevent Wolverine from hunting him down, or at least to kind of like slow Wolverine down because you know, it's pretty unkillable, Punisher resorts to all kinds of brutal tactics, including shooting Wolverine point blank in the face with a shotgun, allowing him to have his limbs basically sawed off, attacking him below the belt, and steamrolling him. Literally steam he got steamrolled he got a steamroller and he ran wolverine over boy wolverine of course survives all this mistreatment but it's still a brutal read and it's brutal in like a lot of ways to me <laughs> definitely a brutal fight number 4 batman versus the joker during the events of endgame no not the marvel endgame the comic story from batman endgame joker and batman essentially end up trying to straight up murder one another or at least from a reader standpoint that's basically what it seems like well joker at this point boasts of a healing factor that he claims he received hundreds of years before due to him being like basically this ancient being, far more ancient than Batman could have ever imagined. It's revealed through the course of their fight that, you know, this is probably not true, as Batman ends up successfully nullifying Joker's abilities in a way that reveals he only recently probably stumbled upon these powers and is definitely not as old as he claims and is just trying to mess with Batman, which honestly is the Joker way. Number 3, Conan versus Kulan Goth. Just when you think Conan is going to take this one, the script gets flipped on you. This fight comes to us from Savage Avengers issue number 25, so good. Here Kulan Goth faces off against Conan, who has come back to battle this fiend with the help of Kang. So you would think, with the impressive arsenal Kang has at his fingertips, that Conan would have this, right? Well, this is Kulan Goth, probably at his most powerful. He's the ruler of the world here, and even though Conan manages to maim him, he's not able to defeat him in hand to sorcery combat in this issue. Though of course there is a greater plan at work here, which ends up balancing the scales in Conan's favor in the end, but during this issue we don't really get to see that. Instead we focus on this bloody and gruesome battle fought with 
with magic, energy weapons, armor, swords, symbiotes, and sharp fingernails. Deadly sharp, if I may add. Number two, Superman versus Doomsday. Superman and Doomsday have an iconic fight that many of us know from the famous story, Death of Superman. Now, if you've already watched my part one of this list, then this fight actually might remind you of another one I talked about over there. And if you haven't watched part one yet, be sure to do that after you finish this video because we have even more brutal superhero fights waiting for you over there. And if you have already watched it, you can guess below which fight I'm referring to as to which one is kind of similar to this Superman versus Doomsday fight. In this fight, Superman gives up his life to basically defeat Doomsday. This works with Doomsday perishing alongside Superman, ushering in the mourning period that would follow for Earth's greatest hero. But while there were those who could not believe what they were reading at the time that this story came out, this shocking moment at least would not end up being quite so frighteningly permanent, with Clark Kent later being resurrected. Even when you go back and read this, it's very like powerful, it's very emotional. Number 1. Miracle Man vs Kid Miracle Man Whew. This is a brutal one. Thanks to Michael Lavender for suggesting this one in the comments. I honestly do not think of Miracle Man often enough in my day to day. When I'm talking about comics, the Miracle Man is something that exists sort of near the back of my mind. So thank you so much for suggesting this one because now I get to talk about Miracle Man, which is just a great time. Talk about a character and a story and a fight. Rather, this one is honestly more of a matter by the end. Less of a fight, more of just a brutal matter. It's true that this is probably one of the most brutal superhero fights in all of comics history, I would say. And I'm actually like sad that I didn't include this on my part one, but you know what? It doesn't have to be the most brutal, it just had to be some brutal fights. So it's still good. Now we can come back to it over here and I can give it a top spot. We're going back to issue number 15 of Miracle Man to talk about this one from the 80s, although it was also reprinted in 2014, so if you see it looking a little bit more modern here, it might just be because we used that art in this video instead, which is actually also from Toddle Ben, so it's same artist, just they also redid it. And I would still say that I think this story has some of the most captivating and gruesome artwork I've ever seen in a comic, courtesy of Toddle Ben himself. In this tragic tale, Miracle Man is forced to fight against his former sidekick, Kid Miracle Man, who is now all grown up. Well, at least his Kid Miracle Man form is. Having lived in this form for years, he aged and also became insane. After transforming back into his human form of Johnny Bates initially, after years of being Kid Miracle Man who was now an adult and was basically crazed with power, he was traumatized to learn of all the horrible things that he had done in that form. So he was put into an orphanage with the hopes that, you know, being around other kids his age might help him to like drown out the voice of Kid Miracle Man that still plagued his mind and was kind of living in there. However, after being tormented by the other kids and suffering from SA, Johnny ended up saying the magical name of Miracle Man, transforming back into Kid Miracle Man and unleashing him on the world. Thousands, like 40,000 people were killed in the massacre that ensued after this transformation. And in the end, Miracle Man got lucky when Kid Miracle Man was forced to say the magical word once more to escape the pain of the injuries he'd suffered in battle. Also, this battle, I should admit, took like pretty much everyone to even just get him to turn back. So that's wild. Knowing that there was likely no way to save Johnny from his evil alter ego and therefore no way to prevent this kind of awful massacre from happening again, potentially in the future, Miracle Man was then forced to offer Johnny a sense of comfort, holding Johnny's head before he like basically crushes it in his hand. Ah! I have trauma just from reliving the story and rereading it. Uh. Number 10, Venom's deadly French kiss. Venom is already known for being a brutal and twisted character in general, especially when he acts as a villain. Yet he's still one of the most popular characters around, no matter his alignment. In 2003's Venom in issue 11, we saw him take on the thing from the Fantastic Four and use a weird talent we didn't really need to know that he had. Venom is attempting to drag away Spider-Man's unconscious body when the thing bursts through a wall, aiming to prevent him from doing so by tackling him. Venom responds by telling the thing it's blobberin' time and shoots out his tongue, essentially giving the thing an immobilizing and disturbingly painful looking French kiss. Fortunately, Human Torch comes in on the next page to put a stop to Venom, but this graphic image won't be as easily burned away. In fact, just the opposite be burned into your mind. The cover of this issue says it all, featuring just Venom's long and slimy looking tongue. 
Ew. Number 9. Loki and Thor brutalize the Fantastic Four This one came to us from a what if story where we saw both Loki and Thor team up to take on Marvel's first family, the Fantastic Four. During this fight we got a brutal moment where Ben Grimm as the thing tries to shut out his famous catchphrase while battling Thor. It's clobberin' time! But before he can get that final word out, time, Thor smashes his jaw off with his hammer. Youch. Meanwhile, Invisible Woman Sue Storm is also in trouble. She is attempting to protect herself using a force field she created, but Loki reverses the polarity of her powers, so all the energy she is projecting outward instead folds in on her, causing her to be crushed beneath its weight and looking almost skeletal as a result in one panel. She's like, I'm dying. Number 8. Gamora Kills Eros In a surprising turn of events, Gamora was forced to take the life of her uncle Star Fox following the revelation that the Black Order would be using him him and not Gamora, as he had previously thought, to bring Thanos back to life. Much to the dismay of Star-Lord, Gamora did not hesitate to kill her uncle Eros, Thanos' brother, though at least she did seem sorry to have to do it. But if it meant preventing Thanos' return, well, then she was more willing to do the deed, stabbing Star Fox right through the chest with her sword. Number 7. Kitty is forced to kill Wolverine Kitty's kills can be pretty gruesome when they happen because of her phasing powers. In this story, Kitty was forced to kill Wolverine when he couldn't be be saved from being used as Hydra's brainwashed agent in What If, Wolverine, Enemy of the State. Wolverine has been teleporting in, assassinating tons of Hydra's opponents, aka superheroes, and teleporting out. A team is then pulled together to finally take him down, and one of that team's members, Kitty, is one of the few left at the end. She tries to reason with Wolverine, but when that fails, is forced to face her arm through his head, turning it solid just before Wolverine slices it off. Wolverine is dead. Kitty's without an arm, and likely every reader was either left with a shocked look on their face or tears in their eyes, or both. Number 6. She Hulk Tears Vision in Half. This was during one of the times in Marvel history where Scarlet Witch basically went crazy, believing the whole world to be against her, and taking it out on them. During the Avenger Disassembled storyline, she was blaming the Avengers for the loss of her children, which she had altered reality to create, as, you know, Vision, her husband, was not actually capable as an artificial life form of fathering children. Wanda decided to attack the Avengers, but indirectly. She appeared to send an altered Vision to do so instead. Her influence also caused She Hulk to go into an uncontrollable rage. When this happened, She-Hulk saw Vision as the main threat and so ripped him in half. Of course, Vision would later return, this definitely wasn't the end for him, and the two would even reconcile. But just seeing this happen in the pages of a comic was still pretty intense. Anytime someone gets ripped in half, it's pretty intense. Number 5. Losing His Daughter One of the most heart-wrenching moments in Spider-Man comics for me comes from a very personal moment for both Peter and Mary Jane. This is like a brutal defeat that isn't even like a fight, like a fist fight. At one point, Mary Jane was pregnant and even seemingly gave birth to a baby girl. However, Mary Jane was wrongfully told that the little one did not make it, when in reality, Pete and MJ's daughter was actually taken by Allison Mongrain, who was later revealed to be working for Norman Osborn. What Norman wanted with the child? Well, we'll never really know, as this was never really revealed to us fans. The only thing that was seemingly confirmed was their daughter's tragic fate, much later on. That is, if we can even believe what Norman says to be true, I personally wouldn't at this point, so I'm still personally hopeful that Peter and Mary Jane's lost daughter could still return one day. Although I don't know how that would work if their marriage no longer existed. Would that affect them having a kid together? Could they have never had a kid together? Does that get erased? Number 4. Got Your Eye Morlin actually is the one to feast on Peter's eye. This happens during the story Spider-Man the Other. In this story, Peter finds out he's dying and sets out to try and find a cure. However, not even the greatest scientific minds in the world, including Black Panther and Mr. Fantastic, can find one. He even tries to travel back in time, but that ends up not working out very well either. Moreland at this time was popping up just to say some cryptic stuff to Peter, like, be careful what you wish for, particularly when you don't truly want it. But eventually, the cat is out of the bag, and so Moreland reveals himself and decides to stop speaking cryptically and start kicking butt. Which is just what he does. He not only beats up Spider Man until he can no longer move and lays helpless in the middle of the street, basically a bloody pulp, but he also eats his eyeball. Yes, actually. Don't worry though, Peter would grow it back. This is comics after all. 
Number 3 Meeting His End Spider-Man actually died in the comics at one point, and not even when he was inside his own body. This happened when he and Otto Octavius, also known as the villain Dr. Octopus, changed bodies. Body swap. Peter did so unwillingly and ended up being tricked by Doc Ock into doing so. Otto hoped to prolong his life and thwart death by taking Peter's younger body for himself while his older body, failing, would eventually shut down. Surprisingly, Otto's plan actually succeeded. However, However, before Peter and Otto's body died, he managed to at least convince Otto to carry on as the hero Spider-Man in his stead. So although he lost kinda overall here, he won that small victory at least, so it's something. Number 2 Infected Something you can't really beat, at least not when it comes to the Marvel Zombies universe, is being infected. In Marvel Zombies, Spider-Man is one of the earliest heroes to be taken over by the zombie virus. This ends tragically for him as the hunger takes hold of him. He actually hurts those who he fought so, so hard and so long over the years to protect Mary Jane and Aunt May, devouring them whole. He does his best to resist, but unfortunately he is completely unable to, and even ends up being one of the zombies who actually lives the longest in this series. So he has to sit with this knowledge for quite some time, which I imagine would really suck. Number 1 Death of Gwen Stacy I think one of the worst defeats that Spider-Man has ever suffered, one of his worst losses, especially in his own mind, is the death of Gwen Stacy. Losing her was one of his biggest failings. This one went down during a fight with the Green Goblin, widely considered to be Spider-Man's main nemesis. As they fought, the Green Goblin used Gwen Stacy kind of as bait. At one point, he tosses her from the top of either the George Washington Bridge or the Brooklyn Bridge, depending on which version of the story we're talking about here. The original one, it was the George Washington Bridge, I believe. While Spider-Man attempts to stop her fall by catching her with his webbing, it's believed that it was actually the whiplash as a result of Spider-Man's move that resulted in her death, causing her neck to snap. We get that terrible snap sound effect. However, Green Goblin has stated before that it was actually the fall that killed Gwen, and that she was actually dead from the shock even before Spider-Man's webbing had touched her. Either way, Spider-Man still blames himself for her loss, even to this day. And to be fair, I mean, editors have confirmed that, yeah, Spider Man kind of did that. But either way, she would have died. So it's not really his fault because she's gonna hit the ground, she's gonna die, or you're gonna catch her, she's gonna die. So death all around. Number 10 Superman versus Batman. This fight doesn't even come from the main continuity, hailing instead from Frank Miller's The Dark Knight Returns continuity of Earth 31. But it was so brutal that it was still incorporated into the main continuity of the DCEU at the time. Batman, at this point in his story, in this alternate world in the comics is not only still without superpowers, but he was also retired. When he decides to return from retirement, Superman is tasked with taking him out, ordered to do so by the president. But Batman isn't prepared to go down without a fight, and a bloody, brutal, and desperate battle ensues between these two heroes. At the end of the story, we later find out Batman seemingly won in his own smart way. Typical Batman. While Batman seemingly dies during the fight, we later learn at the funeral that he is still alive and well, and that Clark may have even been in on this plan the whole time. And friends, before we move on to our next spot on this list, if you love what we do here at Top 10 Nerd, and if you love it when we talk about brutal fights, be sure to check out our brutal playlist for even more content like this. Number 9, Batman vs Green Lantern For this point, we're not talking about Hal Jordan, but instead everyone's favorite lantern, well, some people's favorite lantern anyways, Guy Gardner. Guy Gardner is a Green Lantern who's been known to get on his teammates' nerves. At times, his cockiness is just too much for his fellow heroes, which seems to be the case here for Batman, who in his frustration referred to Gardner as a mongrel. Guy does not take kindly to this insult, and with tensions already having been built prior, he challenges Batman to a fight. A fight he is sure to lose, considering he decides to remove his lantern ring to even the playing field. Batman accepts his challenge and knocks him out in one punch. Number 8 Bane vs Batman Probably one of the most famous fights in comic book history. And this fight, Batman is brutalized by Bane. Bane ends up escaping Arkham and decides to see how much havoc he can cause. When Batman ends up overwhelmed by the hordes 
hordes of recently escaped criminals swarming the streets of Gotham, Bane takes this as an opportunity to strike. Run down and exhausted after three months of non-stop fighting with barely any time to rest, Batman is easily defeated by the villain who famously breaks Batman's back over his knee. Though really the most impressive and brutal feat was honestly getting Batman to such a fragile point which is not easy to do. Batman would recover from this and ultimately return but it would take him quite some time to heal. In the interim he'd be forced to call on someone to replace him, ultimately choosing Jean Paul Valley's Azrael. Marvel's Civil War number 2 is not the greatest and it makes Captain Marvel Carol Danvers to be someone who is just pretty unlikable. She just makes really weird decisions. Decisions that get people hurt badly. Like taking her ultimates, admittedly a pretty powerful team, to take on Thanos thanks to an inhuman precognitive telling her that he will be there. Thanos shows up looking for the cosmic cube which isn't actually on earth and Carol's tactic of just hit him as hard as you can as fast as you can probably sounds good but it's also not really a plan at all. Carol absorbs an energy blast, the human torch is able to hit him with some fire, She-Hulk gets to pin him down giving Carol and Dazzler the chance to blast him and War Machine gets to lay down some fire. Thanos, sure he's a little bruised but he is a okay because when the inhuman Medusa tries to use her hair to like bind Thanos, he grabs that hair and flings her straight into War Machine who accidentally fires a missile at She-Hulk. Then in the chaos following that explosion, Thanos springs on War Machine punching him straight through the chest with his massive mad titan purple grimace fist. Then the ultimates are able to hit Thanos hard enough to end the fight but damn. Now listen nerds, I gotta be honest. I never realized how vicious the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles can actually be. Taking place in IDW's Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles issue number 44, the turtles got split up. Leonardo, Michelangelo, and Raph are on a mission to stop Krang from literally destroying all life on Earth using the Technodrome, leaving Donatello alone with his bow staff facing off against Bebop and Rocksteady, who were given orders to send Donnie to the grave. Now that bow staff gets maybe one hit in before Rocksteady uses a sledge hammer to send Donnie flying and Bebop just snaps the staff in half over his knee. Even with some assistance from Metalhead, Donnie is still at a disadvantage and as he tries to escape he gets a TV chucked at him and then he gets slapped across the face with a computer keyboard. Then the pair just go to town on the lone turtle before Rocksteady uses that sledgehammer to crack open Donnie's shell. It is brutal. Luckily though they are called off before they can fully finish the job. In the Infinite Crisis event, Connor Kent decides decides to answer the door, only to find Superboy Prime who is starting to go a little bit off the deep end and he decides to explain how he is the one true Superboy and he wants to do that by fighting. And it is intense. Even Crypto gets involved receiving a kick to the neck from Superboy Prime and after that little crime against humanity things get real. Prime beats the snot out of Connor Kent, chucking cars and all manner of things but Connor had called in the Teen Titans who in turn called in the Justice Society and the Doom Patrol. That's 28 different heroes. But this only makes things worse. Prime basically is like a kid and he doesn't know how to control this power properly or even understand what is even happening right now. He starts wiping out heroes, accidentally taking the head off of Pantha. He then rips off Risk's arm and wipes out Bushido and Baby Wildebeest with his heat vision while he is crying. It takes a handful of speedsters to then trap Prime in the speed force and end the fight. Okay, maybe a bit of a controversial pick here but Superman Returns has made the list. The movie, I'm talking about the movie. Basically Lex Luthor has used kryptonite to grow a massive land mass out in the ocean which leaves Superman completely vulnerable. He lands on the new island and it's bad news from the get go. Lex and his goons have already gotten in position on this kind of krypton like island but underneath embedded into the rocks is pure kryptonite. Tons of it. So it makes it incredibly easy for Lex Luthor to push Superman down these rocks rocky stairs and then kick him while he's down literally and figuratively. And then his goons start giving Superman this beating that actually kind of feels pretty scary and real and I was like not expecting that at all. I don't think I've ever seen Superman so unable to do anything and then Lex has like this sharp piece of kryptonite that he breaks off in this gasping for air Superman who then falls off of a cliff. Moving on, John Walker aka US Agent is not the most loved character out there but while he is a bit of like an anti-hero, he's still a hero from time to time. For example, when he answers the call to fight against Norman Osborn and his goons during the events of Siege. In the Mighty Avengers number 36, he attempts to stop 
the Thunderbolts from stealing Odin's spear. Unfortunately, another USA affiliated bad guy who is slightly crazy is also on the field today, and his name is Nuke, and he is pretty ruthless. Nuke is able to use the spear against US Agent, slicing off both his left arm and left leg. US Agent would go on to be wheelchair bound, refusing any enhanced cybernetics, and somehow he was still actually pretty capable. Moving on to the third spot today, Atlas is a character for DC Comics created by Jack Kirby joining the comics in the 70s. He was always intended as a kind of anti hero, and he has more or less played out that way since. But in 2010, Atlas was brainwashed by an unknown villain to attack the Justice League, and he is one of the few characters to absolutely pummel the tar out of Superman. Sure, Superman could be slightly holding back against this fellow hero, but I've always kind of hated that argument because then it makes me think that Superman is just faking it when he gets absolutely rocked, and I feel like that's not the case here. Atlas is taking Superman to the cleaners. They're going hit for hit, but Superman, even with help, he just can't take it, and Atlas eventually knocks him down to the concrete. Now, coming up second to last today, following the events of Original Sin, where Thor becomes unworthy to wield Mjolnir, Odin's son attempts to continue his superhero career in Thor number one. Now, unfortunately, it doesn't really turn out too well for him when the axe, Yarnbjorn, proves to be a pretty poor substitute for his mighty hammer. In battle with Malekith the Accursed and the Frost Giants, Thor has his arm severed off with his own axe and he's left to perish at the bottom of the ocean. The new female Thor, who's actually Jane Foster, becomes the wielder of Mjolnir, and it is up to her to defeat Malekith. The original Thor does return with a new metal arm made out of black Uru, and initially he wants his hammer back, but then he sees Jane Foster handling it pretty well and he just decides to drop the Thor title completely and just goes by Odin's son instead. The man was crushed. And finally, in the infamous A Death in the Family story, DC not only slew a Robin, but they did it in the most disturbing way they could have. Jason Todd had disobeyed direct orders from Bruce Wayne to not go near the Joker. The problem was that Jason had just met his birth mother for the first time, who it turned out was a criminal working for the Joker. Also, he's Jason Todd, so he just didn't listen. He went to the warehouse where the Joker and his goons were at with the intention of saving his mom. But in a heartbreaking turn of events, his own mom betrayed him to the Joker to save herself, which of course doesn't actually save her at all. And the Joker leaves her to pass away with Jason anyways. Joker is shown repeatedly beating the snot out of Jason Todd with a crowbar. It's harrowing. Joker leaves him suffering on the brink with an explosive device, and the hero manages to push through his injuries to get to the door with the help of his mom, only to find out that the Joker had locked them both inside. Invincible. What makes these fights stand out isn't just the brutality, but the emotional connection you have to these characters involved, which honestly makes them not just physically brutal, but honestly emotionally brutal as well. Take for example the fighting between Conquest and Invincible. Conquest arrived at a time when Mark was going through some pretty intense stuff, so he was ready to let go and punch something as hard as he could. However, this is Conquest we're talking about, so even when Adam he flew in to act as backup, this fight ended up becoming quite messy. Like many fights in Invincible, this one spanned multiple issues, being wrapped up in issue number 65 after coming to a very gruesome end in issue number 64. Speaking of gruesome, let's turn to something that is also very gruesome. Is it more gruesome? I guess in some parts it kind of is actually. We're talking about Walking Dead. Honestly, reading this fight just made my draw literally drop. Now granted, I'm not as well versed in the Walking Dead series, so anytime I come to this comic and read a few issues, I'm always pretty much shocked by what I read here. It's just, it's a lot of a lot. And this instance of course was no different. In fact, it is probably a beatdown that'll stay with me for some time. In this fight, Rick takes on a group of marauders, unlike in the Walking Dead show where this group is actually more specific, a group we've become familiar with who are known as the Claimers. In the comic, they're just kind of like a random group, I believe, of awful survivors. In the comics, Rick also only has one hand at this point, so keep that in mind, having lost it to the governor. But even with him having both hands in the show at this point, they made the ending to this fight the same. And both endings are brutal. With Rick in a bind, his arms restricted at his sides, he's asked, what are you going to do now? He responds by biting the man's neck zombie style. Uh, yeah. Also, I just love how so many of the images from the show and the comic in this fight, like when I went back to watch the scene, are like one for one 
from the panels. It's pretty awesome. Up next, Marco and Alana are the two main characters from the Saga series. At least, they are at the start. The series begins with them both in the middle of delivering their first child while also being hunted down for having said child together. And while they do get away initially, they eventually are hunted down by the military before they're able to safely leave the planet. As such, they're forced to fight and defend their new little family unit. Alana is a deserter who takes no issue with fighting back, but Marco actually swore to be a pacifist since his daughter was born, but something in him snaps when he sees his family in danger. He reverts to a version of himself probably not yet seen since his own time in the war, brutally fighting the attackers. Fortunately, Alana is able to rein him in and calm him down, reminding him of his pacifist oath. Number 7. Dream vs Karanzon One of my favorite fights I have ever read in any book, comic or otherwise, happens of course in the Sandman series. This fight happens during the first main arc in the Sandman comic series, when Dream is tasked with reclaiming his symbols of office. In order to get back his helm in the comics, he must journey to hell to battle and defeat the demon currently in possession of it, one of Beelzebub's, a demon named Karanzon. This battle is described as being the oldest game, that of basically imagining. One can lose through hesitation, inability to take up a solid defensive stance, or lack of imagination. Karanzon conjures up the anti-life in the hopes of finally beating Dream after a long fight. Initially badly beaten by Karanzon's move, Dream does does end up winning in the end, proving himself the epitome of imagination, as what else are dreams really, by conjuring up the concept of hope. Number 6. Batman and Robin vs Green Lantern Oh boy, what can I say about this one? Well, it comes from Frank Miller's all star Batman and Robin, so I think you can imagine how it goes. I will say Frank Miller is like the king of brutal fights, I would say in comics. Yeah, all star Batman and Robin is honestly, it's an experience, if you want to check it out, all the power to you. In issue number 9, Green Lantern comes to try and tell Batman he's taken things too far, warning him that he's putting people in danger and imploring him to please stop. Seemingly, Hal's house call is triggered specifically by the fact that he's accusing Batman of kidnapping Dick Grayson, who he does not know but suspects is Batman's sidekick, Robin. Batman doesn't want to hear it and blatantly denies Hal's accusations, even though, as we know, they are true. As we can see from the beginning of the issue, Batman has also been preparing for Hal's arrival and for the specific confrontation by painting everything yellow. Needless to say, it doesn't go well for Hal. Number 5. Bane vs Alfred What could possibly be worse than the loss of Batman's parents when he was young? How about the loss of his confidant, his butler, and the person who, for longer even than his own parents, has honestly been a parental figure to him? Alfred. I don't think it gets much more brutal than this. While the death of Batman's parents is obviously very tragic, Alfred was there to help pick up the pieces afterwards and in essence helped to raise the boy even before his parents passed. He was probably one of the closest people to Batman. Alfred was shockingly killed by Bane after being kidnapped by the villain. When Damian Wayne didn't take Bane's threat seriously and set out to save Alfred, Bane responded in kind by ending Alfred's life. Not only is this brutal for Alfred, obviously, but this was all part of Bane's greater plan to basically break Batman again, but this time psychologically. Number 4. Joker vs Batman Not just any Joker either for this point, we're talking about Emperor Joker. This is an extremely powerful version of the Joker if you aren't familiar with him. He basically gets 99.99% of Mr. Mixia's Pitalix power after tricking him out of it. Mr. Mixia was going to give Joker only 1% but as I said he was tricked out of basically almost all of his power instead, which is I imagine what would happen if you're trying to make a deal with the Joker. The Joker uses his newfound power to do a bunch of brutal things, one of which is tormenting Batman on a daily basis before killing him each and every day only to resurrect him, bringing Batman back so he could of course do it all again. This was so traumatic for Batman that eventually when Superman does manage to use Batman's existence to basically defeat the Joker, restoring the world to normal, Superman is forced to take Batman's memories of the daily torment actually from his mind, otherwise Batman would actually have been unable to operate as a hero cause this experience literally breaks him. 
Number three, Superman versus Lois Lane. This one really is a brutal beatdown, and it's not one that's intentional, FYI. It's hard to read and honestly helps to justify most of Superman's actions, at least at the start of the Injustice Elseworld story. At the start of Injustice, Joker and Harley Quinn end up manipulating Superman into basically killing Lois, by making him think he's fighting Doomsday. In doing so, they not only have Lois killed, but also her and Superman's future offspring, and all of Metropolis gets blown up too. Unsurprisingly, Superman does not take this very well and ultimately becomes corrupted by the pain of all this loss. Number two, Damian Wayne versus Damian Wayne. Batman has lost a lot of Robins over the years and a lot of adopted sons, but Damian Wayne is his biological heir, the son of Bruce Wayne and Talia al Ghul. He was raised by Talia and the League of Assassins without Batman even really knowing of his existence until years later when Talia just dropped him off on Bruce's doorstep. Initially, the two did not get along very well. Damian and Insisted on killing their enemies as he'd been trained to do his whole life. But eventually, he did come around and began to see the value in his father's approach to fighting crime, respecting it, and even honestly admiring it. Just as their relationship began to evolve into something more resembling a true father son connection, Damien was tragically killed by the heretic. A death that Batman can't even bring himself to avenge when he realizes that the heretic is. Damien's clone. Number one, Mera versus Aquaman. Mera and Aquaman are often presented as being romantic partners and sometimes as a crime fighting Atlantean duo as well. However, this doesn't mean they never fight, especially when things get really comic booky. And during the Blackest Night, things did get really comic booky and they actually had some really good reason to fight. At that time, Aquaman had been possessed by the Black Lanterns, joining their forces, and Mera was driven into a rage by the death of last standing family member. Tempest, causing her to become a Red Lantern. One of the coolest bits of character development for her, which allowed Mera to really tap into, I would say, years of bubbling rage. Talk about a woman and her power. During one page in Green Lantern issue number 50 from the 2005 volume of the series, Mera takes on the deceased Aquaman, and when he attempts to emotionally manipulate her to basically win her over, trying to distract her from her rage by attempting to bond with her over the loss of their son, ultimately, it fails. Mera frightens him off masterfully by responding, I I've never wanted children before seemingly defeating both of the undead that are confronting her here with her liquid napalm blood. 